All right, why don't we get started? So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today's webinar is all about key challenges of data-centric QSP and ML AI, scope of problems, when and how. And today we're gonna have uh, four speakers, Alexander Lukanov uh, from BIS Global, Michael Monin from Biogen, Maxim uh, Kodomchenko from Verisim Life, and Professor Morali Ram Ram Ramanathan, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Morali, uh, from the University of Buffalo. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a, an extremely important uh, area in drug discovery and biopharmaceuticals. Um, it is that point where um, a lot of things have to be done, either calculated mathematically or explored to uh, get ready for either uh, preclinical or clinical trials. And it is a, a very important area where um, many companies um, have to uh, put things in order to make those next steps. So uh, I think today's talks are gonna be very interesting. So for rules of engagement, so we're gonna address questions uh, during or after the, the individual talks. Now, the, um, each uh, um, speaker has about 40 minutes with 10 minutes of time for talks. We'll also do talks at the end in a round table. So based on some of the questions we got, we may explore things a little further, et cetera. I'll moderate that. You can uh, ask a question at a specific time in the talk. And if I see it and uh, we can ask the uh, speaker to engage that. The only thing we just have to be careful of is that we don't go over, you know, the allotted time because that'll make it difficult for others. So I'll, I'll do my best to manage all that. So um, you can uh, put your question in chat or Q&A and I'll keep an eye on that. Um, in the Q&A part, we're going to moderate around. We'll ask the different speakers questions and uh, have their turn to answer them. The panelists and the speakers can ask questions. And then this will be, this is being recorded. So it'll be on demand afterwards. Um, if for some reason you have to leave early or you miss the beginning or a part of the, the, the webinar. So for some of you that are here that maybe aren't experts in this space, I just thought to put together a couple definitions to kind of orient everyone. So pharmacometrics is a discipline defined as the science that quantifies drug disease and trial information to aid in efficient drug development or regulatory decisions. Pharmacokinetics is the activity of the drugs in the body over a specific period of time, including the processes by which drugs are absorbed, distributed, and localized in tissues and excreted. Um, and then pharmacodynamics is the study of a drug's molecular, biochemical, and physiological effects or actions. It comes from the Greek words pharmakon, meaning drug, and dynamikos, meaning power. And then quantitative systems pharmacology is a discipline within biomedical research that uses mathematical computer models to characterize biological systems, disease processes, and drug pharmacology. So, 2015 Visioneers is, is a, a, an organization that was formed after 30 years of working in industry. And the part that I just wanted to mention here before I introduce you to our first speaker is that I'm very concerned, we're very concerned with fair data, um, you know, making things better for the scientists from a scientific method perspective, et cetera. And I've done a lot of work in this space over the years. And one thing that I've noticed is beyond the algorithms, beyond all that work, I personally have worked with clients whose areas aren't as organized as they should be, you know, from like um, even a model's um, um, organization perspective. So one of the things that I bring to the table is we help clients get organized in this space. And believe it or not, some of the tools that others scientists use in drug discovery could be used in these spaces and, and used well to help organize that. And so those are some of the things that 2015 Visioneers uh, do from either a clinical pharmacology perspective or a DMPK, a PKPD. We help clients organize their data and, and their model environments to 
um, get the most out of their efforts and energy. And it's really important because sometimes you're at the, the intersection of clinical and preclinical. And sometimes people on different teams play roles on both sides. And that's when it really starts to get convoluted. And so helping companies sort that all out and keep it super organized, uh, in my opinion, has been uh, a worthwhile effort. So with that little uh, speech that I just gave, I wanna introduce uh, Dr. Michael Monin from Biogen. Uh, he's a principal scientist and associate director in the clinical pharmacology and pharmacometrics. Um, he has over 10 years of hands-on experience in drug development, including translational research and science. And to, it, he helps advance candidates from early stages to pivotal stages. Dr. Monin is an active contributor and reviewer of key journals in the field of quantitative systems pharmacology. And today his talk will outline typical PKPD data and translational modeling aspects. So Michael, it's all yours. Uh, okay, thank you very much, John, for the introduction. So I hope you can see my screen. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Uh, just a second, so let me put it in the presentation mode. Okay, can you see it? Okay. Yep. Good. Just uh, uh, display settings at the top and then just switch it to duplicate. There you go. Okay, just a second. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So is this... Uh, no, nope. just right? go up to display settings. Uh, okay, I see it's here. Okay. Yeah, you're still in. Uh, yeah, okay. You have multiple monitors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Now you can see me. I guess it's, it's on its way. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you, John, for the introduction. So, uh, so I will give you a talk about uh, essentially physiologically based PKPD uh, approaches in neurology, and I will also introduce a particular uh, study, a case study, on intrafecally administered therapies. Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, an example of uh, QSP approach uh, that uh, that our company and we are using uh, basically to, to address uh, uh, drug delivery uh, to the site of action located in the uh, central neural system. Uh, so this is just a quick overview of my presentation. So I will cover a little bit uh, challenges associated with drug delivery and, uh, and uh, access to their targets in central nervous system. Um, I will also go over uh, you know, some published physiologically based pharmacokinetic uh, models in order to predict uh, brain exposures in human. And then I will uh, dive into intrafecal drug administration to enhance access to CNS and introduce uh, uh, special case studies of uh, ASO uh, drug delivery. And my presentation will include only published materials. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me first introduce you a, a concept of, uh, of blood-brain barrier and drug access to, to and drug access to the target sites in the, in the brain, for example. So many central neural system drug candidates uh, fail because they cannot cross a uh, blood-brain barrier. Uh, blood-brain brain effect, effectively isolates the CNS from the blood. Uh, as you can see in the cartoon here, uh, so tight junction uh, uh, proteins connect endothelial cells, uh, basically lining the surface of the uh, blood vessels. And, uh, and essentially uh, preventing uh, drugs or other molecules from penetration directly from uh, blood to interstitial uh, space in the brain or other uh, CNS organs. Also specific enzymes and efflux pumps like PGP transporters may actually remove, may actually remove drugs uh, from the brain as illustrated here. Uh, at the same time, uh, we know that uh, pharmacology of, 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 of the CNS uh, at, at, at therapies may be driven by drug concentration uh, at target site. For example, uh, in some, so, so here's a table just uh, showing a few examples of, uh, of neurodegeneration diseases and potential target location. 
uh, gene expression or a protein that uh, is associated with the disease progression. In case of Parkinson, for example, it can be alpha synuclein protein or, 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 or also called TLARC2 protein, which is produced in the midbrain and uh, subtension nagra. In the ALS case, it can be SOD1 gene, CNNF gene, ataxin 2 gene, and some other uh, genes, uh, which are uh, um, which are widely expressed in the brain, cortex, and spinal cord tissues. In, 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 and in case of SMA, it's predominantly in the spinal cord. So it's difficult to assess uh, drug concentrations at the target sites. Even though we are able to deliver some amount of a drug, it's, uh, we are still uh, not able to sort of quantify this uh, accurately in order to predict the effect. Um, there are only limited approaches to measure uh, uh, brain exposures. Uh, for example, those are uh, biopsy uh, and microdialysis, but these techniques are invasive and, uh, and that perform the only under critical conditions. Uh, sampling from cerebral, uh, from cerebral spinal fluid or CSF is typically used as a surrogate. However, uh, CSF doesn't really uh, represent concentration inside the brain. Uh, another uh, opportunity is to use a imaging technique like, uh, like PET and, uh, and CT scans, uh, but this, uh, this, uh, this technique is still rather uh, qualitative than quantitative. Um, so, uh, uh, so there is a high need in the novel methods that can actually adequately predict drug concentrations at, at sites of action in the uh, uh, in the human CNS. Uh, so here on this cartoon, you can see just uh, uh, an illustration of where the CSF is, is generated. It's typically generated in the uh, 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 in the place called choroid plexus in the middle of the brain, and then it circulates around the cortical area, and then goes down. Um, uh, uh, along the spinal cord, and uh, it's enclosed it in the uh, 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 narrow cavity called the sub subarachnoid space. Uh, so, typically, models used to predict drug concentrations in uh, uh, in human or in uh, animals are, uh, are based on on uh, on uh, on, uh, on uh, comparative uh, approaches. And, uh, and uh, such a compartmental uh, approach views body as a series of, uh, of virtual uh, tissues or areas and extrapolation uh, between, uh, in terms of concentrations or PK between uh, animals and human are usually uh, performed by allometric scaling. And uh, these models are typically uh, very empirical and relatively simple. However, in some cases they can be accurate. Uh, for some drug modalities. Uh, in contrast, uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic models uh, uh, started to emerge uh, 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 relatively recently and the view body in the physiological terms and using a priori or independent uh, uh, or drug independent uh, knowledge of the physiology, anatomy and biochemistry. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so, so this type of models provide a physiological basis for explaining relationship between structural and physical chemical properties of drugs, and uh, and also and also uh, drug drug concentration dynamics, and of course the pharmacology effect, and uh, and this setting enables a, a better scaling from in vitro to in vivo and from animal to human. Uh, the, 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 uh, there are a number of uh, of, of commercially uh, of, uh, available packages exist on the market now, uh, so-called Gastro Plus or, or SimSip. Uh, however, uh, the field of uh, of CNS uh, drug delivery uh, still remains uncovered, uh, mostly. Uh, so here, I just want to, to uh, just want to introduce one example of uh, of a uh, of recently developed uh, PBPK model for uh, antibody uh, disposition in human brain. And you can see, uh, so this model is fairly complex. 
It includes uh, 16 tissue compartments connected uh, anatomically via blood and, and leaf, lymph flows. Uh, so, so monoclonal antibodies uh, can enter. Uh, so, so essentially in every tissue, uh, antibodies can enter through the vascular compartment and exit uh, via uh, venous blow, <laughs> blood flow. Uh, so uh, exchange rates are defined as, uh, for, for example, first order chemical kinetic uh, rates. And uh, essentially it's a mass balance model. Although uh, 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 very complex and, and they rely on, uh, 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 on a large number of parameters. Uh, this is just uh, uh, illustration of, uh, of of the parameters uh, used in this model. So again, uh, in this particular case, which is uh, cited here, uh, uh, they estimated parameters uh, for different species, and they, uh, they 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 basically built a mass balance equations uh, connecting uh, different processes, and uh, and uh, and that enabled uh, a sort of simulations. Uh, so first of all, um, developing the model based on the animal data and then simulations in human. And the outcome of this uh, uh, simulation is illustrated here. So when they are able to predict the plasma concentration and, uh, and CSF concentration, for example, of a certain uh, generic antibody product. And uh, in some cases, uh, we can also extract the concentration of uh, interstitial fluid in the brain. However, still, uh, still uh, information about uh, drug access to the brain tissues, like, uh, like deep brain tissues, uh, may still be missing. Okay, so let me now switch to a special focus of this presentation, uh, which is intrafecally administered antisense uh, 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 oligonucleotide therapies. Uh, so first of all, I will introduce why, why why intrafecal administration is ever considered. Uh, first of all, it's the way to bypass a uh, blood-brain barrier. Uh, in this route of administration, the drug is administered into the CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, in the spine, basically in the, basically, basically in the bottom portion of the spine, as illustrated here on the cartoon. It's very similar to epidural injection, however, uh, however, the injection site is slightly different. So instead of uh, epidural injection case, which is uh, uh, which is done uh, through the uh, uh, narrow space the, where all the nerve roots are located, uh, IT administration or interfecal administration is done uh, uh, towards the uh, CSF flow, which is located in the narrow uh, channel uh, uh, surrounding the spinal cord tissue. So, um, uh, so uh, heartbeat and breathing rates uh, and other mechanical stresses, they basically modulate the frequency and, and the magnitude of pressure oscillations in the CSF. And, and overall, this, uh, this effect may help uh, sort of uh, propagate the drug movement uh, uh, upwards to, uh, to, towards the brain. Uh, now, uh, what are antisense uh, uh, oligonucleotides? Uh, so, so these are uh, short single-stranded uh, synthetic nucleic acid chains uh, with, this uh, with this typical molecular weight about uh, six to ten uh, kilodaltons, and uh, uh, and by in, and the idea is to bind uh, RNA, uh, uh, basically in order to uh, inhibit or, or, or increase uh, 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 production of certain proteins which are associated with the disease. Uh, here is an example of, uh, so on the left you have, uh, on the left you can see an example of the ISO so-called Gapner, uh, which is designed to sort of uh, uh, reduce uh, generation of, uh, of uh, certain targets, uh, genetic targets. And the names of these uh, ASO molecules are tofersen in case of ILS uh, and so on. Uh, they basically prevent uh, uh, mRNA from translation and, and production of a certain protein associated with the DS. Uh, another type of uh, ASOs uh, acting um, uh, according to so-called uh, splicing modulation. And in case of SMN, 
ASO uh, used to treat uh, SMA disease, so-called uh, nursing nursing uh, ASO. It basically replenishes the, uh, the missing or, or, or broken SMN1 gene. Basically, it's restoring it and uh, that the system is able to sort of produce more and more SMN gene, which is missing uh, in, the, in the disease patients. Uh, so where do you usually get the data uh, in order to develop intertypical ISO? So, 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 so the main source of data is actually monkeys, not human primates, uh, simply because uh, NHPs are monkeys are, are, are closest uh, sort of relatives to human, and they have a similar geometry, upright position, and so on. So. Um, uh, so, in the studies that we are referring to here, uh, uh, animals, animals are sampled uh, from plasma and a CSF uh, during, during the course of study when they are still alive and when, when and at certain time points uh, these animals are sacrificed uh, in order to obtain uh, concentrations of the injected drugs in tissues. So based on this uh, data, we built a, a, a mechanistic uh, ASO model or physiologically based PK model for ASOs. Um, and uh, the cartoon here shows the structure of this model. So um, uh, basically uh, the CSF flow or CSF uh, cavity is introduced through this uh, uh, sort of middle column here. Uh, the injection, the intrafecal injection is done into the lumbar space and then, uh, and then, uh, and then we specify exchange of, uh, of drug uh, concentration between uh, uh, other CSF compartments in the spinal cord, uh, so-called thoracic, cervical, and up to the brain, a proximal brain and the distal brain, CSF. And, uh, and, uh, and the CSF uh, as a fluid, it has a sort of interaction or it may exchange uh, the drug uh, with the adjacent tissues. In case of uh, spinal portion, uh, the drug can leak to the uh, spinal cord. And in case of brain CSF, it can actually penetrate uh, through the membranes and, uh, and, uh, and go directly to the cortex, hippocampus, cerebellum, pons, and other regions. Uh, so, uh, so how we inform this model development is basically again based on the monkey study. So the uh, compartments uh, which are marked by this uh, a lollipop sign in this uh, schematics here, uh, they have essentially the concentration data for these compartments from the monkey studies. And, and in this model, we specify uh, several types of parameters. Uh, so first of all, it's transfer rates, which are empirical parameters which are uh, estimated based on the data. And uh, volumes, uh, those are physiological volumes that are introduced, uh, like essentially they're fixed. Uh, so, so the data that we get from monkeys is, is typically, is uh, basically, uh, typically it's linear with, with those. And uh, here, this is just an illustration of this type of data uh, for different uh, dose levels. Uh, we get concentrations uh, from a, a number of animals and just see that it's uh, almost linear. Uh, that uh, sort of simplifies the model development, at least uh, we're assuming that, uh, that a dose is not a factor here. I mean, the, uh, it's dose linear, dose proportional. Uh, so the, the so the monkey data is typically very very sparse, as you can see on the illustration here. Uh, uh, so uh, we are getting quite uh, substantial information from uh, from plasma because we can sample uh, uh, relatively easily after each administration. Uh, in CSF, we can get pre-dose concentrations still in live animals. However, in tissues, we are not able to get time course for every animal. So we essentially in tissue, we have only one observation, only one time point uh, per animal. Uh, that actually uh, suggests that we are not, uh, when we estimate the parameters of our model, we are not able to estimate 
uh, intersubject variability. Uh, that means that essentially the only approach we can use is essentially just a, 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 a so-called naive pooled analysis that uh, will estimate the parameters as a sort of average average parameters, assuming that uh, every animal behaves uh, similarly to uh, other animals. Uh, here is just uh, a quick introduction into the optimization tools that we are using. So um, just an illustration, uh, the three tools uh, on the left, they are widely used uh, 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 population-based pharmacometrics uh, tools used for non-linear mixed effect analysis. Uh, they are very powerful. Uh, however, we found that for the problem that we are dealing with, which is actually quite a uh, over-parameterized system, uh, ADAPT5 was the best choice because uh, it allows us to work with uh, these large, large models, large data sets, I mean, large, large multi-parametric models, but we are not interested in estimation of variabilities. The only uh, random effect will be here. It's just the estimation of uncertainty of the data and the model. Um, so therefore, we're using ADAPT5 uh, as a simulation tool, uh, essentially as an uh, optimization tool. Uh, so here, uh, it's uh, just an illustration of two models. Essentially, it's the same model with uh, different uh, parameterizations. Uh, so model number one uh, provides a parameterization in such a way that every parameter uh, has its unique value and, uh, and estimated. And in that case, we see uh, standard errors are quite high. Uh, so, so, so CV, so coefficient of variation of estimates uh, is above uh, 50 percent almost in every case. In case if you do a, a sort of uh, more parsimonious model with less parameters, uh, essentially assuming that uh, that some groups of parameters are, are equal, then of course we get a better picture in terms of uh, of uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty decreases, of course. Uh, however, however. Uh, in this case, uh, our model has less degrees of freedom. So uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, which model is better right now because uh, this is uh, uh, essentially it's not the focus of my presentation today. It's 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 just an illustration of the approach. Uh, so here uh, I just wanted to illustrate the comparison of the estimates. Uh, of the predicted concentrations at the uh, and the monkey data. Uh, so first of all, if you look at the concentrations predicted and measured in lumber CSF and in plasma, uh, we see that that essentially uh, a distribution phase in the CSF uh, lasts over two or three days with a sharp initial drop right after the intrafecal injection. And plasma PK follows the CSF PK within a, a couple of hours delay. Um, and then long elimination phase detected in the CSF, right, is basically determined by the tissue health life, meaning that uh, um, essentially meaning that the uh, penetration to tissue determines a sort of uh, the residual time uh, of ASO drugs in the CNS tissues and overall. And, they, and they, you may also notice that, uh, that concentrations in the liver and in the kidneys, they actually drop faster, indicating that liver and kidneys are the major ASO elimination organs. Uh, this is actually quite uh, important uh, uh, picture, which is, uh, which essentially shows us uh, a total sort of uh, just the overall distribution of the intrafecal ASOs. And, uh, and here we see that that only up to four or five percent of the dose of intrafecal ASOs uh, reach, uh, reaches its uh, CNS tissues, total CNS tissues, including uh, spinal cord and cortex and, uh, and the whole brain. So it's only up to four or five percent, uh, which may seem is not a lot, but essentially, if you compare this to the uh, other routes of administration like IV or oral, 
it's much more abundant uh, exposure in the CNS rather as compared to administration via other routes. In case of, uh, as we saw previously, uh, in case of antibodies administered intra uh, 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 intravenously, we are getting something like 0.1% uh, of the dose in the brain. In that case, here we get something like 4 or 5% in the brain, which is at least uh, like, uh, like uh, almost 50 times more exposure. Uh, so this is just to illustrate the, uh, the, the mechanism of distribution. Uh, so essentially after we give an intrafecal dose in the CSF, uh, so most of, essentially most of the drug, uh, so most of the ASO amount uh, uh, basically leaks to plasma to systemic circulation. However, uh, three or 5% per, uh, goes through the, uh, CSF brain barrier and uh, basically ends up in the CNS uh, in the CNS organs. Uh, so after some time, like uh, a few days, uh, so we observe an interesting behavior as I mentioned before. So when uh, the decay of the concentration in the CSF essentially follows the concentration decay in in in, in other CNS tissues. Uh, so, so meaning that the CSF concentrations uh, can be a sort of surrogate measure of the exposure, at least a relative measure of the of the exposure in the CNS tissues. Of course, it's not always understood uh, the ratio. Uh, I mean, uh, between the CSF concentration and the uh, uh, and the brain concentration, but at least in terms of half life, or, uh, or, or for how long the drug stays in the brain or other CNS areas, uh, CSF can be used as a good uh, sort of indicator. Um, so okay, so once we get uh, uh, a good picture. A good understanding of uh, of drug distribution, ISO distribution in monkey. Uh, apparently, we want to translate this to human. Uh, so, translational methods are currently being developed. Uh, currently, the, the simplest way is to uh, simply scale uh, the physiological volumes that were fixed for monkeys originally. Just scale them by certain factors to uh, to sort of get. Uh, human volumes in organs, like in different organs, like in the brain, in the spinal cord, and uh, and other tissues included in the model. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, volumes they are included as a sort of dilution factors. Um, uh, another assumption is that the rates of uh, distribution or kinetic rates that we estimated based on the monkey data remain the same in human. This is a pretty uh, it's a pretty strong assumption. However, based on the uh, sparse emerging data that we are gaining, uh, gaining from clinical studies, uh, we see that this uh, this assumption is uh, is reasonable. Uh, so, okay. So now, 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 once we get the approximate picture of uh, of human PK at the tissue of interest, so for example, in the cortex, as shown here. And we can use other information about uh, 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 about the potential of pharma, uh, for pharmacodynamics or, or, or pharmacology, for example, from from a transgenic mouse experiments or any other uh, data that relates to the concentration of, of, of the drug and, uh, and potential inhibition of of protein generation, for example. And it can be either direct model or uh, or indirect model, depending on the data that we have. And then we do projections uh, in terms of a decrease of a target, target engagement, so-called target engagement in the uh, in the area of interest, for example, in cortex. And that actually gives us an idea about what dose we should uh, select for the first inhumal studies in order to obtain a certain um, target engagement in the different areas of interest. Uh, so the caveat of this approach is that uh, we don't know, uh, in front we don't know the relationship between uh, CSF biomarkers or the decrease in human 
and uh, and the actual doll. So this is. Uh, this is uh, essentially this this uh, this, uh, this, uh, this information typically comes later during the uh, clinical trials um, and now i came to the uh, final slide of my presentation so let me conclude that uh, that the pbbk models can be viewed as a subset of qsp approaches in general and developing this type of models usually requires a large amount of information data and knowledge and the problem is that uh, that this information is not always available, especially for the uh, CNS uh, therapies. Uh, yet, uh, these models enable identification of key processes and rates that drive the whole body distribution and especially access to target sites within the CNS in the brain. Um, uncertainty of these types of, of, of models uh, still can be high. And uh, we can hope that uh, that novel techniques like in, like uh, like commercial learning and AI based algorithms combined with traditional QSP or or, or PBPK models can enable deeper utilization of data from other sources and basically enhance understanding of of, of the drug delivery. Michael, you muted yourself. Okay, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, now uh, I'm happy to take any questions. So if you just want to raise your hand, I can select on you and you can mm -hmm. ask the question or you could put the question in the uh, Q&A or the chat box, whatever is more convenient for you. And those are all in the, the ribbon for Zoom. Um, either at the bottom or probably the top of your screen. Okay, let me find that. See. So uh, while we're waiting for questions, mm -hmm. um, if any of the panelists or speakers mm -hmm. wanna ask, go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking that in, our, in one of our last webinars, the, mm -hmm. the, the concept of mouse models and the translation to humans was uh, very, uh, didn't work too well in the grand scheme of things. And I think you've kind of pointed that out here as well. Could you speak to that a little bit maybe? Yeah, so uh, so in general, uh, so physiologically based models, they are by definition a uh, sort of generic. They should not be uh, like, uh, like animal specific, right? So because uh, ideally this type of models uh, should include, uh, should, should include uh, flaws of liquids like like blood, venomous blood, CSF, whatever, every every aspect of the body, and then uh, then the penetration rate. In some cases, for some modalities, uh, this these parameters are known. However, not for all modalities. For example, in case of intrafecal administration and uh, and at the sense uh, oligonucleotides, uh, this information is not available. That's, uh, for example, uh, in our case, uh, we call this model uh, uh, PBPK model. However, it's still uh, rather more uh, empirical. And uh, if you take this model and uh, apply it for other uh -huh. uh, molecules, it may not work. It, right. it may work or, or, or may not work. So yep. some modifications need to be done okay. in that case. All right, uh, Max, you have a question. If you unmute, you can ask your question. Yeah, please, Maxim. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I have a question. So the first question is, so a very interesting subject is, so mm -hmm. my Thank question you. is, did you use any chemical parameters or physical chemical parameters of them for your PPPK model? Because we know like yeah. lock PPPK mm -hmm. very important, but mm -hmm. I, I guess you just avoided blood bread barrier because you uh, simulated intratecal administration. Yes, exactly. This is a very good uh, point. So, uh, as I indicated, uh, so this model is rather empirical still, and uh, we do not take into account any chemical or biochemical characteristics of these molecules. However, we build the structure, basically interaction between the compartments in a in, in certain way that it reflects uh, the prior knowledge of, of the distribution. Uh, if, I can, if I can go back to this. Yeah, for example, here, uh, so directionality of, of, of these uh, rates, uh, it, 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 it sort of speaks 
for itself, it's based on the experience. So, uh, so, so for example, we define only one, uh, uh, essentially only one directional flow from the CSF to plasma or central compartment because we know that there is no transfer from 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 blood to the back to the CSF. Uh, however, there is an exchange between uh, the CSF and uh, and tissues. Uh, and also the connectivity, uh, the certain structure and alignment, it's based on a sort of physiology. Although, yes, the caveat is that this model is not a generic model. So uh, in order to account for other drugs, like uh, maybe, anti uh, maybe antibodies, we will need to do some, some, some re-estimation of parameters. Okay, got it. Thank there are actually are. other uh, other efforts involving uh, computational fluid dynamics technique to understand uh, the actual physical flow of the CSF, and that's another sort of uh, uh, another component that that we need to be taking into account later. Mm -hmm. Although uh, actually, it's a good point too. So uh, based on our experience, uh, we found out that uh, that under current condition of the injection. Uh, the distribution along the CSF is rather homogeneous. It gets basically homogeneous quite uh, quite rapidly after the injection. So it may actually tell us that uh, that uh, such a compartment level uh, uh, representation of this uh, is quite reasonable. Well, that brings us to the next question here mm -hmm. that may be related to what you just answered. In terms of transfer of drug from IT site to brain tissue, mm -hmm. you have divided the CSF space into subcompartments. Do you right. think the fluid dynamics in CSF can have significant effect on the distribution? Yeah, so it's a very good question. So uh, again, again, so, uh, so this model is valid for certain conditions. However, if you want to change the condition, let's say the injection site, for example, if you introduce instead of lumbar site, we will uh, inject into the cervical or the cerna magna, then the distribution may be slightly different. So then in that case, we will need to do additional experiment and, and reparameterize the model. Uh, so uh, for that purpose, we actually define a larger set of, of, of exchange parameters so as I shown here, so this is, so basically one, one, uh, yeah, uh, essentially one of the reasons why we specify this model one is it's because it, it's a sort of represents a finer a sort of discretization along the spinal CCF rather than uh, uh, in the case of model two, we have just, just, just two parameters, uh, assuming a sort of homogeneous faster, faster equilibration. Uh, so if there is a reason to believe that uh, gradients emerge along the spinal CSF, we definitely can uh, uh, split each compartment into a larger number of subcompartments and basically solve this as a one-dimensional PD, for example. <laughs> and we have done that too. Okay. Uh, and then we have one last question uh, mm -hmm. from Sasha. Sasha, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Michael. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, very exciting to see some of the interesting results. My question is, when you build that complex model, um, have you done any feature analysis on the model, meaning that all the compartments are necessary and what would be the um, ranking? Good question, yeah. Yeah, of course we did, uh, we tried many, many different structures and the different parameterizations and uh, and uh, I tried to play with the number of com uh, with the number of uh, like a sort of uniform compartments uh, combine. Let's say, for example, uh, make single CSF compartment rather than split it into five CSF compartments. And uh, yeah. So, what would be your strategy? Kind of, what was the criteria to decide one versus another? Is it simple the deviation, the smallest deviation from the measurement point? So there is based on. So some... I think numerically, if you look at the AIC, which is a uh, information criteria, or other numerical um, um, metrics such as likelihood, um, uh, also the standard error of estimates uh, to understand uh, how uncertain the estimate is. Uh, 
uh, things like that. And uh, we also look at the profiles directly and uh, visually, at least, if we are able to sort of capture the main uh, phases. For example, we know that there must be sort of a multiphasic degradation from, for example, right? So if, if you're able to, to capture the, the behavior qualitatively, then we are in the right path. Thank you. But of course, it's a sort of, it can be endless process, <laughs> selecting models. <so. laughs> and, and we have to stop at some point. All right, awesome. Great talk, Michael. Mm -hmm. I think um, we'll probably wrap it up on that last great question and we'll go to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so our next speaker is Professor Morali Ramanathan. Uh, he's at the University of Buffalo uh, and his work is on the physiological effects and pharmaceutical treatment of multiple sclerosis, MS. Professor Ramanathan has extensive experience in pharmaceutical applications of big data and modeling analysis using machine learning and artificial intelligence, and uh, large high dimensional data sets containing environmental factors, genetic and immunological biomarkers, quantitative neuroimaging metrics, and clinical measures in MS. His talk will outline the aspects of big data enabled biomarker based AIML guided. QSP models for pharmacometrics. Professor Ramanathan, the floor is yours. I'll just stop sharing. Am I good? You are good to go. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start out by uh, thanking uh, the organizers for this opportunity to present uh, our work. And uh, I know my title uh, uh, is long. It says Big Data Enabled Biomarker Based AI ML Guided Quantitative Systems Pharmacology Models for Pharmacometrics. And at first sight, it might seem like I went into a jelly bean jar full of buzzwords and uh, uh, and picked out uh, a handful, uh, but hopefully you're in the audience and you'll be able to sort of track along with these buzzwords and the points of contact uh, and their points of contact uh, in the work that I am going to present. And as John pointed out, John pointed out, my work uh, is really at the intersection between computational modeling and simulation methods, uh, pharmacometrics, um, and pharmacometrics, both from uh, what I would consider a drug discovery and development perspective, as well uh, as uh, the bedside clinical perspective, partly because of my interests in um, multiple sclerosis. Here's my disclosures. Uh, and so what I want to do is um, start out with an outline that includes a very brief uh, skeleton of uh, of background. Uh, my focus is really on uh, the role of AI and ML in pharmacometrics, uh, quantitative systems pharmacology. And I want to sort of highlight uh, what are the opportunities and challenges in this space and what are the strategies at the uh, 100,000 foot uh, level that we face. And so what I will do quickly after this brief break uh, background is jump quickly into two case studies um, uh, that, uh, that uh, use uh, some of the strategies that I'm going to talk about uh, that are relevant to pharmacometrics and uh, QSP. And both of these case studies, what I'm going to do is uh, start out initially by uh, presenting the biological context in which we approached uh, some of our AI, machine learning, and data challenges. And the two, uh, and then I'll dive into the methods and the results and hopefully uh, end up with conclusions. And I'm going to talk about two case studies. The first case study uh, that I'm going to talk about is called generalized pharmacometric modeling. And the context in which I'm going to talk about is basically how do we leverage AI for modeling diverse populations. And the second uh, uh, case study uh, focuses on disease progression models uh, for chronic diseases and to use AI to sort of explore uh, disease biomarkers uh, that change during aging. And we'll get into the details of that in just a second. So let's jump into some background. 
So uh, as you know, I started out uh, with, uh, with big data in my title, and uh, there are a variety of operating definitions for big data. And typically, uh, one focuses on the number of dimensions, more than 50, sample sizes uh, greater than 1,000. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, there's the, um, the classic Vs of big data, velocity, volume, variety. And I think there are many, many other Vs that have been subsequently added. And you can see that uh, the big data space uh, really benefits from AI and ML. And finally, I sort of, uh, since much of our audience is in the drug discovery, drug development, and pharmacometric spaces, I want to note that many of the applications uh, that we look at uh, in our domain are uh, relatively small, small data uh, compared to what uh, uh, a traditional big data source, let's say Google or Facebook, or, uh, or Twitter would be dealing with. We are dealing with small data uh, compared to the scales, but uh, our problems are actually quite unique. And the other thing that I've done, and I don't know whether all of you can see, uh, that when you have very small amounts of data, uh, uh, there's relatively little uh, that you can do with a great deal of certainty. And then there's uh, this region that uh, we like to think about as the power law region uh, where the training data set increases and uh, the amount of uh, learning that we get uh, improves our understanding of the system improves. And finally, I think this is something that I uh, found quite informative uh, is to think about uh, what happens when your, uh, the amount of training data increases asymptotically, uh, you reach a place where you see diminishing marginal returns, and typically you'll still see some uh, irreducible error in this region. So this is a nice way to think about uh, data sizes and how they affect our ability to learn or garner information about the system complicated system of interest. Hold on. Uh, so there's a lot of jargon in the big data space. I won't bore you with the details, uh, but uh, typically when I use the term data point, uh, it's a data point in high dimensional space and you can represent it as a vector, x1i, x2i, where i is the ith case and one, two, three are different dimensions. Think of it as different variables on the same subject and potentially uh, in a large data set, each of these attributes, each of these x's, x1, x2, xd, may be a completely different data type. One might be a binary variable, the other might be a continuous variable, and another might be ordinal. Uh, we talk about the term dimensions, and that refers to the number of attributes of each uh, uh, point or case, so D is the number of dimensions. And those of us who think quite simply in terms of Excel spreadsheets uh, or um, statistical spreadsheets, the number of columns of data. And then of course, there's the buzzword metadata uh, and uh, metadata is data about the data, who, what, when. And uh, uh, many of us in the uh, statistical space are also familiar with the idea of a data dictionary, which is a repository or a separate file about the information on the variables in a database. For example, uh, whether you measured something in nanograms per mil, picograms per mil, the data dictionary is a place you look at. Oops. Uh, so I want to start out by talking about the pros and cons of big data. What are the uh, advantages big data brings to the table? What are the disadvantages? As I alluded to before, one of the big, big advantages of use, uh, using big data uh, meaningfully, I, I emphasize the word meaningfully, uh, is that learning becomes possible that you can learn uh, uh, a lot more about the system if you're able to use the, uh, the data more effectively. Big data uh, can be more diverse. Uh, that means that if you're interested in special subpopulations, because the data set is large, if it has been properly collected, uh, it can have uh, information on the diverse subsets that you're interested in. Uh, rare events that uh, you don't observe in small data sets may show up better. 
And of course, from a statistical perspective, uh, you get better estimates of variability. Variability standard deviation uh, is hard to estimate uh, properly uh, from uh, big data. And with that uh, comes the idea of reduced sampling error. Uh, what are the disadvantages of uh, big data? Uh, you have the curse of dimensionality uh, because you have a large number of variables, uh, you run into, uh, into the curse of dimensionality. The space, the hyperspace increases dramatically and this causes a whole range of, uh, of big data problems, if you will. From a statistical uh, uh, perspective, because you're looking at so many variables, so many dimensions, uh, you uh, have run into multiple testing uh, issues that have to be addressed uh, in the process of interpretation and putting the information together. You run into computational complexity, and then, of course, you run into issues related to collinearity, heterogeneity, and uh, uh, things that can compromise power. They may be redundant variables. And, uh, and uh, so gathering information becomes a little bit more difficult. So hopefully this uh, slide frames uh, the pros and cons of big data uh, for you. So I want to sort of put a look at the space of machine learning and AI, uh, specifically from a framework of pharmaceutical sciences, by which I, uh, I uh, mean uh, drug uh, uh, discovery and development and pharmacometrics. And you can sort of see uh, 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 at the 10,000 foot level, uh, what's, uh, what are the most common methods that have been used in the literature? This is a little bit dated, it's 2021. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of work on supervised um, machine learning uh, problems. Uh, many of the papers, the majority of papers and publications have focused on uh, QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationships. And in a sense, uh, QSAR is um, low hanging fruit because many of the problems uh, with respect to uh, chemical structure space and molecular property space uh, lend themselves quite easily uh, to, uh, to the strengths of machine learning. The problems in pharmacometrics, uh, modeling and simulation are a little bit more challenging and we'll get to that in uh, just a bit. But this is sort of, uh, the lay of the landscape as of a year or two ago. So what I want to do is uh, present uh, 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 a guiding uh, framework that we in my group have used to help our thinking about using AI and ML uh, in pharmacometrics. And what I want to start out with uh, is by pointing out uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses uh, and needs and challenges that we encounter in pharmacometrics today. Uh, one of our challenges uh, is the fact that we have smaller sample size. Our sampling is sparse in the scheme of things. We traditionally use compartmental models and other uh, QSP models uh, that are highly tailored uh, and fit for purpose. And we use estimation and statistical methods whose main strengths are parameter inference so that you can draw conclusions about the larger population from the sample uh, that you have. The methods are generally uh, things like non-MEM and all these other methods that, in, uh, uh, that do nonlinear mixed effect modeling are computationally intense. And the other part of this uh, is that these methods are well established and proven for drug development, for dose identification, finding out more about, uh, about the data that you have in a typical drug development setting. So those are the strengths. And then what you have at the big data set, uh, and we've alluded to uh, many of these uh, already in the previous slide, I won't dwell on them, large sample size, big data after all, less sampling noise, diverse and representative if it's nicely done. And uh, so what we think about uh, when we uh, think about ML and AI in my group uh, is that AI and ML is potentially a bridge uh, between big data and pharmacometrics. And, uh, and we have to realize that the vast majority of big data uh, that we deal with 
today are data sets that are being independently obtained in the population settings uh, and uh, in the very general population or clinical settings. So these are sort of independently acquired separate from the drug development process itself. Uh, so in order to work with big data, AI and ML methods are data driven and autonomous. You don't need a very, very specific model like you do in pharmacometrics. They focus uh, greatly on prediction and generalization, and they have to be computationally efficient because they have to handle big data effectively. So this is the overarching picture uh, that both my case studies are going to build on. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, uh, talk about generalized pharmacometric modeling, and this is a phrase that we coined, and it's based on a paper that we published about two years ago, and I'll build out the case uh, uh, in just a bit for generalized pharmacometric modeling. Here's the reference in, in case you want to dive into the details. So I'm going to start out by providing the biological context in which we began this work. And you might remember that what we are trying to do as a group is to try to find out sweet spots, opportunities, low-hanging fruit uh, for machine learning and AI uh, to, to deliver fruit and benefits in the pharmacometric space. And we decided that uh, one potentially interesting area uh, would be to look at the issue of underrepresented groups and diversity in drug trials. And as many of you know, the US population is increasingly diverse and will be only become more diverse in the years to come. However, uh, when we do drug trials or even uh, phase one, phase two trials or obtain uh, PK data, uh, our samples are much smaller and these samples are not fully representative of the population at large, the population that the drug, uh, or even the population of patients, uh, the drug is intended to treat. And uh, these disparities have got the attention of the FDA, and there's now a guidance uh, on uh, how you can, as a drug development scientist or as a drug company, uh, address uh, underrepresentation in drug trials. And basically, there are ways to design trials and do things uh, differently so that you improve uh, the diversity of the sample of individuals who join your trials. Uh, what we are trying to do is, in the interim, uh, build bridges between existing diverse data sets and uh, pharmacometric data. So that is what we are going to try and do. And here's the overarching uh, view of our approach that we call generalized pharmacometric modeling and how AI fits into this. Um, and so what I want to do is to, everybody see my cursor? Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is the typical pharmacometric uh, modeling space. Uh, you have a structural modeling model, you have a population model, and PK data is typically fed into the structural model and the population model. And then uh, you in include subject-specific data to develop a covariate model, and the covariates help explain uh, more of the variability in, in the PK that you see. So what we are proposing uh, is that we build out or enhance the covariate model as a starting point for bridging into, uh, into both external data and AI. So what we are going to do is feed external data uh, and the covariate model into an AI framework and figure out better ways uh, to get a uh, a more generalized, diverse prediction of the covariates, and you can feed that back into your structural model, your population model, your covariate model, and you would get uh, uh, pharmacometric outcomes and treatment outcome profiles uh, that are more representative than the current framework. So this is a method to think about how AI can play into traditional pharmacometrics. So uh, this is a nice scheme. How do you go about uh, testing it? And so uh, because uh, part of my lab works on the clinical aspects of uh, 
cholesterol uh, and lipids in multiple sclerosis, I became interested in cholesterol dynamics in the humans. And, um, uh, and uh, there's actually a surprising amount of data on cholesterol dynamics in humans. Uh, and uh, what we decided to do was use a relatively old uh, 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 study of cholesterol. Uh, it's a compartmental model of cholesterol. And uh, you can see there are three compartments. There's a production rate of cholesterol. There's a clearance of cholesterol. There's a distribution into two uh, peripheral compartments. And this is the reference. And these authors, uh, uh, did a surprisingly thorough job of exploring covariate models uh, with the technology that they had at that time. And they had built out um, covariate models for the production rate, uh, the size of the compartments, the total size of the cholesterol pool, things like that. And so we decided to focus on the elements of this covariate model and try to develop uh, methods. And uh, oh, so here's the reference. It's an old paper by Goodman et al, Journal of Lipid Research. And here are the clinical methodologies. There were 54 subjects. And this is a typical a group of people that might be treated uh, with, uh, with statins today, for example. Uh, and I cannot tell whether 1980 was the pre-statin era or the post-statin era, uh, but it might actually be difficult to get a sample like this uh, for a uh, trial uh, today, given the number of uh, individuals in the US who are treated with statins. So this is our starting point uh, for cholesterol dynamics. So now we uh, wanted to focus on a big data component. And so what we decided to do was pick uh, the NHANES study. Uh, the NHIN study is a very large biannual cross-sectional uh, health assessment of adults and children in the United States. Uh, it's the National Health and Nutritional uh, Survey. I think the E stands for environmental, I'm not sure, uh, but, uh, but it's conducted by the CDC. And what they do is they do the survey every two years and they spend a great deal of effort uh, making the survey representative of the population at large. So this to us was a very interesting data set. And the goal is they don't cover all the diseases that are of interest, uh, but they sort of touch on the biggies that are of public health interest. And here are some of the things that they do. Here are some of the methods they use. There's medical data, there's dental data, there's physiological data, and there's a whole bunch of laboratory tests. All of them very, very standardized from year to year, cycle to cycle. So this was a, a good starting point. And so we first asked uh, as a scientist and with the, uh, uh, with the freedom that we have uh, for our time in academia, we said, you know, let's take a look at whether big data makes sense at all. And so uh, we asked the data, uh, asked the, the question, is NHANES a representative of diverse populations? And this is a very open-ended question. And so what we really wanted to answer was, so this is a population-based survey. Can we answer questions related to specific diseases in specific subpopulations uh, using this data in any meaningful way? And what we did, I decided to do was, uh, was look at insulin sensitivity in Mexican Americans. And this is a very intriguing question uh, uh, because insulin sensitivity in Mexican Americans uh, has been explored in a variety of epidemiological disease uh, case control studies, the San Antonio Heart Study, the IR, uh, IR uh, insulin resistance atherosclerosis uh, study in the context of diabetes. And the bottom line is Mexican-Americans uh, tend to have far greater, uh, far lower insulin sensitivity and far greater insulin resistant than even other Hispanic populations, white, black, and other race populations. And sure enough, uh, what we found was we looked at measures of uh, insulin sensitivity. This is done through what is called a HOMA-3 model. And we found that in the Mexican-American sample that we had in NHANES. So this made us believe in the utility of NHANES for studying metabolic diseases and metabolic questions uh, uh, in general. 
And so what we decided to do was go into Enhance and look for salient predictors of the uh, of the variables in the covariate model uh, that was developed by Goodman et al. Uh, for cholesterol in humans. The first step that we did was random forest regression. I'll answer questions related to this method, but basically this is a decision uh, tree-based method that uses an ensemble of random uncorrelated uh, forests uh, to draw conclusions. And we picked the first 15 uh, most dominant uh, variables uh, that showed up uh, from random for forest regression. And these are some of these. And we did, um, um, quote unquote, validate uh, many of these measures, even the included interesting ones like cadmium and urine specific gravity using other sources in the literature. So these were the features, if you will, uh, for the next step. And then the next step, what we wanted to do was really uh, build a model for how all of these 15 variables interact with each other. So the goal is really to have a data-driven QSP-like model and explain the interaction between the different features uh, using the enhanced data. And here is um, uh, the method that we use. We use Bayesian networks and Bayesian networks uh, essentially look at a data set and they make directed acyclic graphs. And they have some really nice properties. Uh, for example, these graphs are topologically ordered. You can draw uh, lots of them. Um, and they look a lot like models uh, that many of us who are familiar with QSP uh, work. And as here are some definition, uh, but the basic mathematical idea is that we are decomposing the joint distribution in this particular case, this particular joint, uh, joint uh, 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 distribution has been decomposed uh, using this dicyclic, uh, a directed acyclic graph. And uh, so you can basically get a QSP model. And so what I'm going to do is jump into some results now that I've given you the broadest outlines of the methods that we use. We use random forest regression followed up uh, by, uh, by uh, Bayesian networks. And so uh, uh, what we did was uh, we looked at uh, the correlation between the random forest predicted values uh, of these covariates, the production rate, um, the first uh, the central compartment, the two per, uh, the one peripheral compartment, and the total cholesterol pool. These are the things that Goodman et al. modeled. And we looked in the context of the data they had provided uh, for their patients. We predicted it using random forest regression, and we predicted uh, using um, uh, the observations uh, in the uh, uh in the NHANES data set, and we found a really good uh, correlation. You can see we do quite well. And then what I want to do is show you the results of what, uh, what Bayesian networks can do. As I said, the goal is to model uh, the interdependencies. And you can see here, what I've done is taken the features that are associated with uh, this, this associated complex of M1, M2, P, M1, M3, P, M total PR, and how they tie into all the salient features. You can sort of see how, which variables uh, connect to what variables and how this complex disease process uh, might progress. So this uh, uh, is uh, the framework for actually building out uh, data-driven QSP-like models uh, using biomarkers. Hopefully you can sort of see I'm touching on some of the buzzwords in my title as we move along. So we've now got an initial bridge between big data to pharmacometrics. And our goal is to use um, such approaches to extend covariate models to diverse populations and to explore this idea of building data-driven QSP models uh, from big data a priori, and then going on and applying uh, these QSP models uh, from the general population to disease-specific settings. So the next case study that I'm going to talk about is what I call a biomarker-based uh, systems pharmacology. 
And here uh, you can sort of see the paper that we've drawn on. And uh, uh, the term that I'm introducing is a biomarker-based systems pharmacology. You've seen elements of this already as we took biomarkers from the NHANES data set and built a systems pharmacology model. But here our goal is to make uh, disease progression models for metabolic diseases. And we are going to use some of the same elements, but in a different way. And uh, the problem, uh, the biological framework that we are interested in is to look at aging. And uh, none of, um, uh, all of us here uh, really know that aging has distinctive effects on cellular and biomolecular processes. And much has been learned about the specific aspects of aging in the last uh, nearly 10 years uh, since this important cell paper that found key, I think these are nine key uh, biomolecular and cellular processes that are affected. I haven't listed all nine. I've just pulled out a few that are relevant to my interest in metabolic biomarkers, nutrient sensing by mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, genomic uh, instability, and so on. But the other thing as we bridge across the scales uh, is to realize that these cellular and biomolecular processes have consequences on regulatory pathways, multiple regulatory pathways, and these changes to regulatory pathways cause changes in physiological, psychological, and behavioral processes that we associate with aging uh, typically. And then, of course, uh, overlaid on aging is the fact uh, that many uh, diseases uh, show uh, age dependence patterns uh, in terms of onset. And of course, uh, metabolic comorbidities uh, especially emerge uh, in aging populations quite frequently. And of course, aging eventually affects independence and quality of life. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to address uh, as I, as I uh, tiptoed into this complicated problem uh, was to see if we could get, on the, get a handle on something that has always intrigued me. And that is, at least in metabolic diseases, this homeostasis in one physiological process can cause orchestrated changes in others. We all know this intuitively, uh, but we typically uh, tend to treat one condition at a time. So for example, we know that glucose dyshomeostasis and diabetes can cause changes in triglycerides. Here's carbohydrate metabolism affecting uh, lipid metabolism, affecting cholesterol metabolism, affecting renal function, body weight, and so on and so forth. And of course, the fact that uh, chronic comorbidities can affect uh, treatment outcomes for other diseases as well. So this is the biological framework in which we are talking. And so you can sort of see I like buzzwords and we call this all natural. Uh, and the goal was really to sort of model natural history in the general population. And here's how natural history can map to disease progression. If you have a good study a longitudinal or a cross-sectional study of the general population over time or as a function of age, what you will see is the natural history of metabolic biomarkers turn into disease progression of diseases like hypercholesterolemia or, uh, or, um, or diabetes in a subset of the population if the population study is well done. And we are focused on biomarkers, and we are defining a subset of metabolic biomarkers that I call pathologically relevant biomarkers. And there are many uh, pathologically relevant biomarkers. Glucose is one of them. You know, I think it's a, it's a biomarker of health, uh, but uh, we use it to, to diagnose diabetes. We use it to treat diabetes. We use it in treatment trials. So it's, it's, it's a pathologically relevant biomarker. And our goal is to build models that are data driven and biomarker based. And here's our big picture cartoon of how we might do it. So here's population based big data. You can have also affect, uh, you can uh, enrich your population based uh, big data, with data from clinical registries, uh, which are also getting bigger and bigger with time. 
And our goal is to feed this data into, uh, into a framework for learning the salient predictors. And this does not have to be random forest regression, can be other machine learning, deep learning techniques. You feed it into a method like Bayesian networks uh, that can create a QSP model if you're interested in QSP model, or simply skip both of these steps through a deep learning method that, uh, that takes care of uh, predictor dependencies. So now you have an AI ML framework for something that does the functionality of a QSP model uh, for aging in populations. And then I'll talk about, about the next step, which is stochastic modeling. You can sort of see that I, I use hybrid methods a lot because our goal really is to use AI and ML uh, to bridge other techniques that are more effective at doing the clinical questions that we are interested in. And here, uh, the the, uh, the hybrid component, the traditional technique uh, that we are going to use is time series modeling and we are going to use what are called vector auto regression models. And the reason for using vector auto regression models, these are time series models, uh, is that they have an element of stochasticity. And these models take the joint distribution of all the time series, whether it's glucose and lipids and cholesterol and body weight at the same time. And um, they give you a covariance matrix that can be modeled. You can model a covariance matrix very effectively that tells you the orchestration and the crosstalk between these biomarkers. So that's really what we are trying to do here, at least in spirit. So this is the NHANES data set that we used and more details here. And what we decided to do initially was use uh, aging biomarkers from a, that were identified from a paper by Crimmins et al, 2008, here's a reference. And they looked at three uh, um, groups uh, on metabolic uh, biomarkers. We also had another data set that was available to us called the metabolic plus leptin, uh, because this was the same metabolic biomarkers, uh, but also leptin, because leptin emerged as an important metabolic factor uh, later uh, during the study, and it was collected in a subset of NHANES. So we analyzed it separately because uh, the, uh, the, uh, the leptin data was actually, uh, we had very small sample sizes for leptin. So you can see this data set is about 6,400 individuals. This is 33,000. And we also looked at cardiovascular biomarkers uh, because this was a subset of biomarkers that were identified as important, uh, was an important cluster in aging by Kremens. So we applied our techniques, uh, Bayesian uh, modeling, uh, Bayesian network modeling, I'm not Bayesian modeling, but Bayesian networks. And you can see that the Bayesian networks uh, not only generate very useful uh, interconnection maps between the different biomarkers, but they also tell you how much confidence uh, you have in these connections and about the directionality of these connections. And so I, there should be a few here, uh, uh, connectivities that can be considered bidirectional uh, because they're relatively weak. For example, uh, here uh, you can see that the confidence in the directionality uh, is, uh, is weak, but our confidence in the presence of a connection is strong. So it, it's, it's really a very effective way to sort of um, critically assess uh, your connectivities in complex networks. So here's our data from, uh, from uh, uh, the vector autoregression models, and I'll give you some context. So what we've done is we've done uh, Bayesian networks. We've built a network uh, with the key features yeah, in the network. And uh, because of the network modeling, we know the interconnection between uh, the models. And what we do in WAR is look at the whole panel 
of 15 biomarkers, the joint distribution, if you will, and the evolution of that joint distribution over time. And the nice thing about NHANES is has data all the way from 10 years uh, to greater than 80 years. And here's a graph of some of the biomarkers. You might recognize glycohemoglobin here in this particular subset, which is uh, a biomarker of uh, diabetes, total cholesterol, lipid biomarker. And so we looked at two different VAR approaches. Uh, broadly, what we decided to do in, in VAR, VARs are very widely used in economics. And there are two main strategies for using VARs, restricted VARs and unrestricted VARs. Let me, the unrestricted VARs, what you might do is, let's say you have 15 uh, biomarkers in your uh, Bayesian network, you let the covariance matrix connect all of them in any way it pleases. So you have a very general unrestricted covariance matrix. And in the restricted war, what we did was we limited the interactions in the covariance matrix of the joint distribution only to the patterns that were predicted by the Bayesian network. And we applied it to the uh, test training framework, you know, classic uh, AI ML framework, 75% training, 25% testing. And I think all the graphs that I'm showing you are test data. I haven't shown you all the training data here, uh, but, but basically we found that, uh, uh, that just as we guessed, the Bayesian networks actually performed uh, restricted Bayesian network uh, covariance matrix models did a lot better than the unrestricted open models that had greater flexibility. And the other thing that we were now concerned is one of the things with stochastic models is the potential uh, for overfitting. How do you assess these complex multidimensional models for overfitting? And we decided to do this in a somewhat creative way. Uh, so, uh, so here is um, what I call the annual sampling. Remember, we have uh, about, about somewhere between 50 to 100 uh, subjects uh, in at each year of age. And so what we decided to do was first evaluate what we call annual sampling. That means we sample everybody every year and we do test and training. And you can sort of see that our models uh, do really well in this context. And we also did what was called triennial sampling. Uh, what we did in triennial sampling, the goal was to assess overfitting of our bar models. Uh, what we did was we did the training on data that was sampled every three years. And then what we did was we, so there's, uh, you can sort of see that these are the training points for every two training points. There are two blue missing points that were not included in the training. And the idea was that if we're, uh, uh, models are grossly overfitting, what would happen is you'd see gross overshoots at the points that were not included in the training setting, which is, you know, you have two points that will uh, help you assess that better. And we, we found that we didn't uh, do badly at all when we, uh, when we reduced the sampling to three years. And then, of course, we went overboard. We sampled every five and 10 years. And uh, uh, we found that our VAR1 fits were generally visually quite good for three and five years, which is reassuring. Uh, but the performance were reduced with the 10-year sparse sampling situation. And finally, as I end, I sort of want to uh, uh, leave everyone with uh, what I think is a useful thought and, uh, and a useful philosophy. Uh, and the first is, I, I really like, I love the name of this theorem. This is an actual rigorous theorem. It's called the mill free Lunt theorem. And it is beautiful in so many ways. The mathematics uh, is very interesting and it's all great. Uh, but it also uh, emphasizes the fact that there is no universally superior learning method that performs uh, all other methods. So that... Um, 
there isn't a panacea that uh, is going to solve all our problems. We have to select the best methods and the onus uh, for selecting the best AI ML methods on us, uh, pharmacometricians and QSP uh, folk is on us. And yes, uh, simple methods can potentially outperform uh, sophisticated methods. And so every time you jump to a more complicated, difficult to use or difficult to interpret uh, black box method, you should invest uh, in evaluating the value proposition for doing that. And you no know, free lunch, uh, it sort of encapsulates that whole idea in many ways. And the, here's my summary and conclusion. I want to point out that integration of AI into pharmacometrics and QSP uh, presents unique challenges. AI can be, a uh, can be an excellent bridge between big data and pharmacometrics. I'm making the case that hybrid methods uh, are a promising strategy. Traditional pharmacometrics, nonlinear mixed effect modeling is not going away anywhere soon. And uh, they might well be a necessity given the nature of the problem. I've shown you how Bayesian networks can help QSP-like structural models to be built uh, with data and built them objectively. And the other two uh, points uh, derived from the case studies. One is the uh, GPM, the generalized pharmacometric modeling. And I've shown you that restricted bar models can be used to describe the orchestration of biomarkers over aging. And then I'm going to ask questions, but maybe I'll leave, acknowledge all the folks I've worked with over the years. Uh, most of my AI ML work uh, was done by Mason McComb, who's now uh, at, uh, at Amgen, and Kelly Fellows who's another student who started out uh, uh, going in this direction. Um, and there are some of my long-term collaborators in, uh, in MS on this slide as well. I have time. Uh, I wonder whether I have time for a question. Yep, we got time for two. Um, thanks, Dr. Ramanathan. That was great. Um, the first one was, uh, can PCA be applied before Bayesian network construction to reduce features? Um, I, I, I ab absolutely. Absolutely. I think there, I, I am particularly, I'm somewhat agnostic about the exact methods that you use uh, uh, to reduce features. Okay. And so uh, we ended up using random forest regression uh, because it's a, it, it's a method that's very uh, easy to explain to others, you know, or at least uh, because it builds on decision trees and it, there's a very graphical representation that you can use. And it's uh, it works across both uh, discrete binary as well as uh, continuous data. Uh, we were particularly interested in the continuous data features. Uh, I know PCA does that as well. Uh, so, uh, so it's a feature reduction uh, method. And I think that there's something to be said for Bayesian networks uh, because they help you distill the information and see the interdependency pattern. But again, we are developing methods now that replace the, the entire random forest uh, Bayesian network uh, middleware, if you will, with deep learning. Right. Now that's going to come with some advantages and some costs. Uh, and that's uh, the comparison that we are in the process of doing. So I'm like, actually agnostic as to exactly what goes in there. I'm more interested in how do we um, get uh, uh, to the point of using big data? How do we get to using AI and ML uh, to further drug discovery development and pharmacometrics at large? Yep. Okay. Uh, the next question is, great work and great talk, Dr. Ramanathan. Can you elaborate on how we can leverage such models to aid drug development in metabolic disease? Uh, I, absolutely. And I think that the goal uh, now, uh, uh, I sort of alluded to one of uh, the uh, approaches that we can use. Uh, so right now I'm working primarily in the context of NHANES, which is a population-based data set. So now uh, from a big data perspective, uh, we 
really have good uh, registries that have good clinic data. So for example, if you're working with spinal muscular atrophy, so rare disease, you might have a data set uh, out there for of a large number of uh, SMA patients. And you want to sort of enrich uh, your uh, big data sets uh, with information from, uh, from a disease state or from a, uh, from a clinical trial of of actual patients on treatment. So we want to build that bridge uh, between the two disparate heterogeneous data sets and use it to uh, use it for better feature identification. So for example, if a disease is evolving, let's say after 45, many metabolic diseases uh, show up after 45. Uh, the goal might be to use uh, your uh, treated population or clinical trial data set to look at the progression in the general population uh, at uh, 45 and beyond. And then, of course, uh, we can start looking at uh, other aspects of treatment. But you have to remember that getting at large treatment data sets is currently a big challenge. And that's, uh, uh, that's, that's really the, uh, the, the, the rate limiting factor, it's going to come. Uh -huh. You know, these clinical data sets are going to become increasingly available. We also have a huge shortage of longitudinal data sets that are representative. And so we have to cross all of these data challenges and data availability issues as we move along. I'm right now in the process of composing strategies uh, because I, I sort of see that many of these data issues uh, will resolve themselves in the, in, in the progress that we are going to see. Yeah, great, awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that was a great talk and there's a lot, uh, a lot in there. Our next speaker is Dr. Maxim Kodomchenko. Uh, he is the principal DMPK scientist at Very Slim, Very Sim Life. He has a strong experience in developing AI-driven biosimulation platforms that enable pharmaceutical industries with the technology to accelerate and improve outcomes in drug development to advance human health. He also leads research and scientific, scientific efforts to make uh, bio ISM the most accurate predictor of PK, PD, and DDI profiles of xenobiotics. He will make the presentation about the use of AI-driven platform for prediction of drug pharmacokinetics following transdermal administration. Max, you're up. Yep, sure. John, I can't share my screen because I'm disabled from screen sharing. That's my fault. I uh, I missed you when you came in. So there you go. All righty, as it works. I okay. hope you can see my yep. screen. We can see it. You're, you're good to go. Yeah, great. Great. Thanks, John. So right again, my name is Maxime and I'm principal of the MPK scientist in Very Sim Life. And our company implements artificial intelligent methods for accelerating drug development and drug discovery process through prediction of drug pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and with some approaches to patient certifications. But you know, before joining the company, I'd been working in academia as a pharmacology researcher and professor, and I participated in various studies in drug development, like in vitro experiments, animal experiments, even clinical trials, and we also used classic methods. And working within Silica company, I just realized that uh, AI methods are the very powerful tool for pharmacology for any field of pharmacology. And here I'd like to briefly describe my own research experience when we use our AI-driven platform called BioISIM that implement mechanistics models and AI algorithms. So, and just for the start, so here we can see the main stages of drug development process that we usually used to use working in my lab. And you can see it in with a blue arrow. And you see they're pretty long enough, like months. So some of them are even years. 
And with a red arrow, you can see that some stages with the help of silicon methods may be accelerated. And that will result in lower costs and shorter time for the drug to get to the markets. And preclinical studies are definitely one of the most important part of the drug development process. And it takes substantial amount of time and financial resources. And when you use mechanistic computational tool for PK and PD, and actually they have been used, I guess, for the last two decades. And they show that they have some weak points. They can reduce time. They can reduce expenses for drug development procedures. But the accuracy and translatability sometimes, I would say, is a bit poor. <coughs> Excuse me. And when I use AI-driven approach, it can help increase accuracy of the mechanistic models and can dramatically accelerate drug development stages, in particular preclinical studies and clinical trials. Uh, just like to show how uh, in our company, AI-driven technology may be used in all stages of the drug development integra processes integrated with mechanistic uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic models. This algorithm in associated with a drug database may use any information for prediction of the drug behavior in human body. The results may be based on the experimental PK parameters or they may be predicted from in vivo data or in vitro parameters, as well as just from structural and physical chemical properties of drug compounds. The main advantage of, of the AI approach is its capacity to impute incomplete data. Thus, it can just fill missing values uh, like of physical chemical properties or PK pro parameters that they later will be fed into PBPK model and provide more accurate and realistic results. AI model can be trained for any targets and thus it can predict any parameters necessary for PK or PD or just knowing the efficacy of known drugs or drug candidates or any other antibiotics. Yeah, and here is our study. So in our study, we have chosen one therapeutic area, which is uh, painkillers or analgesic drugs. Here we can see the main therapeutic area that is based on drug spending. And you can see that pain management is actually in the second group of drugs with like a billions uh, annual spendings. And moreover, it should be taken into account that many diseases, in particular, like in oncology or metabolic disorders, they are often associated with pain syndrome and they require administration of analgesic drugs. And among the route of administration over here, transdermal drug administration, for example, is often confused with topical, but both of the route of administration usually related to epicutaneous application. That means getting drugs on the skin and then uh, acting locally or going into the systemic circulations, just similar to the oral drug intake. For our study, we're actually devoted to uh, prediction of the behavior of local analgesics that could be applied on skin, acting as topically or acting in a systemic way via transdermal administrations. And just there, uh, a, a bit of explanation about our study. So we know that pain always indicates some problems in the body, probably disease, trauma, or anything else. And it is related to irritation or simulation of specific peripheral structures that we are called pain receptors. They convert physical or chemical influence or thermal influence into pain signal and transfer them into the brain. And that's how we feel it. And we have some drugs because actually pain is actually, is actually not a pleasant sen uh, feeling and sensation. So we have some groups of drugs that can mitigate pain syndrome. And we use it for many diseases. Um, but actually only two of them are pure analgesics and non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs they belong to a group of so-called conventional analgesics. That means their primary focus or their primary activity is killing pain or reducing pain syndrome. And why we chose 
topical route of administration. But it was actually dependent on the drug influence. Analgesic, I usually use as systemic agents. So they get into the blood circulations and affect target structures anywhere in the body. I would say across the whole body, in any compartments. And usually such therapy is associated with high incidence of adverse reactions. In particular, when we are talking about opioid drugs, we know that they have some capacity to in induce, for example, drug addictions. They have some severe toxic signs, including respiratory center suppressions and other adverse reactions. But in contrast, when we use drug topically, that means we have uh, or we expect of drugs to provide their local activity because of the direct engagements with receptors or efferent transduction ways without any systemic exposure. And that, of course, means that such approach, approach would provide faster, stronger influence with dramatically lower risk of adverse effects. And moreover, sometimes using topical drugs, for example, if we are focusing on the receptors that are located in, in specific tissue like skin or, or adipose tissues, that uh, I would say target engagement of drugs being in systemic circulations would be very poor or quite low, resulting in low efficacy. For sometimes using topical administration, we can increase drug engagement because of very focused uh, or local High, concentrate, uh, high local concentration of drugs just around the targets that we want to target. So actually high activity and low risk of a side effects. There are main advantages. Okay, and for this, uh, just a bit of pharmacology, uh, for this purpose, we have very powerful drugs. We, they belong to the group of opioid energetic that are, called for, that are used for the pain management. And now we have uh, like a great number of opioid energetics being approved by Food and Drug Administration for the use in patients with pain syndromes. Of course, they have some limitations. They have some relative contraindications, but nevertheless, uh, there are some conditions, some diseases when they use it necessary. Mostly like the first uh, analgetics, uh, they are natural uh, of natural origins. But now we have some synthetic compounds. And depending on the uh, activity and target engagements, we have some uh, drugs, we call them full agonists. So they engage with uh, all types of opioid receptors and usually they provide greater efficacy, but unfortunately they also have a lot of side effects and adverse reactions, mostly related to the activity on today. Uh, effects on the brain structure and finally on the brain functions, including cognitive functions, of course. So just to reduce the and to reduce the incidence of or likelihood of side effects, there are some drugs uh, that have slightly different mechanisms of action. They are partial agonists, so they do not activate all types of receptors. Uh, they can activate all, only specific types, and that reduce the likelihood of getting some uh, side effects in patients, but uh, on the other hand, that results in reduced activity. So usually using different types of drugs, we're always trying to provide better help for patients and at the same time to reduce the risk of side effects. And they're using both of the drugs, in a, we definitely see that the, like, probably we've heard from the news that opioid crisis were uh, across the country, because uh, regarding of the use of these drugs, regarding of the type of activity, we see some drug addictions and all the following side effects. So that's why we are looking for the new opportunities and one of the opportunities is using them locally. For example, looking, uh, using them for transdermal administration, that is what's our focus. And why transdermal administration is so promising and so interesting. So here is the structure of the skin, the detailed structure of skin. So actually the whole skin is composed of two main layers. The first one is epidermis and another one in, is dermis. And they're quite, quite different. And the main function of the skin and the layers is the barriers. They need to protect skin and everything is under the skin from the environmental factors that could be aggressive. 
and the very important top layer of epidermis. It is called stratum corneal, and it is usually considered as a separate layer because it serves as the main barrier for water and for many, many chemicals and chemical compounds. And I, I would say that stratum corneal should be considered as, 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 a, as a separate barrier also because this is actually a dead tissue. So as you see, it looks like a brick and mortar structure. So, so we have just a lens of bricks. They are pretty firm and in a very compact way. And, and, and this, is, this is just a dead tissue. So it's, it's really difficult to penetrate it. So, but nevertheless, some compounds, not all of them, but some compounds may penetrate through all the skin layers, including stratum corneum, and then can be used for transdermal administrations. Nowadays, and mostly all of them come not uh, in a form like, like gel solutions, but mostly in, in a more sophisticated devices for transdermal administration. For example, like here, they call patches. They can provide slower and longer drug administration or drug absorption through skin, providing more efficient and safer therapy. Why we say that uh, they can provide more efficient and safer therapy? Because as you see on the right, in the lower part of the slide, here are the drug concentration after IV administration or oral administration. And we see the horizontal line. This is a curve showing plasma concentration of drug after transdermal administration. And it looks very look like a, 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 a IV infusion because we definitely see steady state concentration because of the regulation release of the drug from the transdermal patches. And that actually very promising results because as you see using IV, we just see very high peaks they do not provide steady state concentration, or we can see the steady state concentration is much lower than we expected. That is why we usually say the transdermal administration could be very promising, except the problem with transdermal absorption, not only because it is uh, not typical for any drug, but sometimes it's difficult to, to measure it in a living organism. And moreover, recently, just getting back to our case study, recently it was found out that along with some pain receptors that are located in skin layers, there are some opioid receptors presented in stratum granulosum and stratum basale, that are actually two different layers of epidermis. That's why sometimes the pain or may be suppressed just via these peripherally located receptors. And just the same way, if we can use a drug that can simulate stimulate peripheral opioid receptors located in epidermis, it may have provide analgesic effect, effects with very low risk of toxicity because drugs, we, we want the drugs to be in the skin without any systemic exposure. And that would be very important for the treatment of any skin lesions that may be associated with severe skin syndromes. But here there are some very important questions for, for physicians, for pharmacologists, for the MPK scientists. What would be the drug concentration in skin after topical applications? And what are the fraction of drug that reaches systemic circulations and, and that would, what would be the drug concentration inside skin layers? And also there is another key question, what would happen if skin integrity, in particular the integrity of stratum corneum is damaged? And this question that are very difficult sometimes to to answer using some in vivo uh, methods or clinical trials. So uh, we know that after transdermal uh, administration, drug can penetrate, not all drugs, but some compounds can penetrate stratum corneum. As I mentioned, this is the most firm, uh, the firmest layer in the skin. So if drug applied on skin, that is supposed to go through skin layer in rich systemic blood circulation. And the main barrier for drug transport, as I mentioned, is stratum corneum, and it is barely permeable, and active molecule may go through it using at least three main routes. It may be sweat ducts, it may be hair follicles, or it may be just direct diffusion through stratum corneum. Sweat ducts is usually a way for polar molecules, and so they have low penetration capacity through deeper skin layers. So, I mean, if drugs can go through the um, 
through the sweat ducts, it, this kind of molecules would stuck in lipid layer just under the skin and never reach the circulations. And that's probably some problem with accumulations and further uh, toxic signs. Hair follicles also doesn't significant input into drug absorption because they are pretty shallow. Therefore, mostly drug molecules penetrate superficial skin layers simply diffusing through it. It may be just either via lipid channels around the cells, but it's this way is a pretty long because it's it looks like a maze for the drug to get through it, or going through the cell membranes. But that means the drug should be very highly lipophilic. And if drug is very highly lipophilic, again, it may stuck in adipose tissue in hypodermis just under the skin. And uh, th that is why when we estimate transdermal drug absorption, it would be very important to understand the drug behavior inside the skin, how drug behaves and how it can reach systemic circulation and would be the fraction of drug reaching systemic circulation and would, what would be the fraction of drugs that remain in skin. And for our case study, that, that also important to know what are the skin concentra uh, drug skin concentrations engaging with, uh, with the targets, in our case, with opioid receptors. So what we have created for this purpose, we actually use uh, the pretty uh, known PBPK model, very similar to the one that uh, Michael mentioned in the first presentations. So it just composed of, of some uh, compartments, uh, indicated the main, uh, main organs in the body, arterial blood flow or venous blood flow connected to the oral compart uh, gastrointestinal compartment simulating oral intestine, uh, uh, oral drug administration and, and for the absorption. So what, what we actually employ using this system, so we created a better way of understanding drug and physiology altogether using machine learning and deep learning. And so here is the main key way how we can marry I would say two engines together. So we have knowledge engine and research engine. So when we use knowledge engines, this is what already exists. That means um, for our PBPK model, that's kind of fractional volume for, for compartments, the fractional blood flow rate, rate for these compartments, as well as uh, some PK parameters for drug compounds that already know. And research is a, a prediction, interaction prediction, because some of these parameters are not known and they should be predicted by, uh, by ML engine. And the results would be looking like that, that should show what would be the drug, drug PK profile. And so to what we can do to also increase the accuracy, because as I mentioned before, the accuracy is the most important point for any prediction of drug pharmacokinetic and drug pharmacodynamics. So we use a comprehensive framework. And here is a simple illustration how we work with incomplete inputs from any of those features. I mean that we are using mechanistic model for modeling of drug pharmacokinetic profile, but usually, you know, many drug progress and parameters are missing. So, so, so uh, sometimes, you know, even when we go to the, some public databases and proprietary databases, we are unable to find some specific parameters like protein binding or maybe microsomal clearance and other things. So if, if you don't know them, the accuracy of PBPK model would be quite low. And AI could be deployed to input incomplete data. In other words, when we use multi-compartment models, it serves as a knowledge engine, what we know, operating parameters with known and verified values. And when we turn on machine learning, it works as a research engine, providing some insights into what the values of missing parameters should be. And then we do the irritative process, irrit or we can even say irritative feedback process between these two engines that can lead us to more accurate, uh, accurate parameters. And when the model makes prediction, we can also identify the underlying mechanisms that aren't captured adequately and actually send it to, to the users of the system. And here there are what we've got. With BioISM, we had validated what the, more than uh, 1,500 compounds with experimental PK profiles 
and we uploaded them into the database and then use it for testing and for training of their uh, artificial intelligence agents. And the results demonstrate that after testing and validating, here is a high accuracy level for prediction of basic pharmacokinetic parameters with, that usually used for any drug development study, like maximum concentrations, area under curve, mean residence times, and volume of distributions. Here is the graph showing the accuracy in predicting main uh, pharmacokinetic parameters. They're pretty decent. And we would say that they, they are usually derived from incomplete data. And I, I will show on my next slides, what, what do I mean when I say incomplete data? But getting back to our study. So when we are uh, talking about transdermal drug absorption, you want to know drug absorption through skin and we can use two types of models. Here is the first one. And this is a single layer model, assuming skin is just a, a barrier, a single barrier. And it, it, this model is good for calculation of steady state flux, uh, also for the permeability coefficients, for diffusion coefficients, and finally for bioavailability, because actually drug absorption would correspond to the peak's first flow. So the drug absorption rate would depend on the concentration differences, on the thickness of skin layers, and it also also depend on the square on which a uh, drug was applied. A technology can treat the skin barrier at a bulk, predicting the whole transdermal absorptions on the base of specific chemical descriptors. So it does not need to provide accurate information for skin rotation, but it can show uh, what, what is the systemic exposure for the drugs going through the skin. But if we need to know what is the skin retention for drugs, that would be uh, applied topically. Then we can use mechanistic model with three layer scheme. And it is more relevant because each skin layer, like stratum corneum, viable epidermis, and dermis, are treated as a separate skin compartments. And all absorption parameters, diffusion, res resistance, permeability, can be calculated separately, but using the same equations. And in this case, AI model can treat each skin layer separately, predicting drug permeability through each layer, including rotation in each particular layer and drug concentration changes in time. Generally, this model uh, is actually pretty much the same as the previous one in terms of implementing drug parameters and predicting drug behavior in skin structures. On the other hand, a three-layer skin model also allows prediction of trans, trans, uh, drug transdermal pharmacokinetic in healthy skin. So we see the three types of equations showing the drug absorption through skin, but also in the case of skin lesions. Because usually when we have the skin lesions that may affect drug absorption, that probably related to the uh, problem with stratum corneum integrity. It may be just disrupted or it just removed. And in that case, drug absorption would be much higher. And for transdermal modeling, we can just remove equation that is reflecting drug absorption through stratum corneum and proceed with a, with a prediction of drug absorption rate as we did it before. And it would show what's gonna happen with drugs in the, in the case of application on the wounded or in injured skin. And usually that type of conditions are associated with pain syndrome. So we decided to test both of, this, um, of these models. And we, ha we have two drugs, oxycodone and buprenorphine. All of them are opioid analgesics. All of them are agonists of opioid receptors. All of them were shown to be, uh, to be good for using transdermally, because probably I need to mention that there are just a few of drugs that can go through the skin by themselves. There are about maybe two dozens of drugs approved by FDA that doesn't require any specific formulations and permeability enhancers to go through skin. But these two drugs then, then can do it without any permeability enhancers. And uh, you see the specific drug parameters and you can see there are some values that are marked with asterisks meaning that these values were not available for the drug that we used on the study. And uh, therefore, these parameters, we needed them to be predicted. 
for, for us to, to use in them in our model and, and use them in three layer skin model uh, required for calculation of drug behavior. We know that most important parameters for AI algorithms are lipophilicity, which is log P and uh, the association can stand with this PKA and usually it is available uh, at experimental or it even can be calculated at least for PKA. Uh, using spe specific software or even uh, driven algorithms. And they actually define the main drug properties and including the capacity to go through the skin or stratum corneum and also all other structural data that can be used as the descriptors to predict the behavior of those drugs. But other, other parameters like, for example, tissue partition coefficients or transdermal permeability, those are really difficult to get obtained uh, using in uh, public databases, also using some in vivo animals. But we actually use them as predicted by AI algorithms in our study. So prediction, uh, so AI model was trained using the uh, our proprietary database that contains uh, a thousand of compounds, including all FDA approved drugs. And we use it also for validation. So for validation, we use the publicly available results that you can see on the screen. And you can see the main settings for those experiments that I given to the right of the slides. And uh, this is just a, a data uh, published in uh, the journal articles. And we just selected for two drugs, three round of administration for all of these uh, drugs. And we use the model that we trained. How accurate would be the predictions of the three round of administration for these two drugs? And this uh, slide demonstrates the results of our predictions. So we can see that uh, there are uh, black circles that show in the experimental observables. And we see red dotted lines that shows our predictions. And we would say that accuracy of the prediction is pretty high. Uh, I would say more that even from my own experience that red dotted lines, uh, lines uh, looks a bit more realistic but that's probably because of the variability that we always observe doing any experimental study or any animal studies. So we can see that our test drugs are pretty, pretty good for, for predicted by our engine. So we decided to pro proceed and we use this, this calculation for prediction of the specific parameters and specific coefficients showing drug absorption through each layer of the skin. So we can see both test drugs and the partition coefficients between stratum corneum water, dermis and stratum corneum, and viable epidermis and stratum corneum. That actually could be used uh, for the calculation of drug concentrations and drug absorption rate and flux through skin layers. Just the same, there, there were some permeability coefficients that were calculated using the same things and resistant coefficients. So actually those data would be just enough to use the equations that I showed before for the three layer model to calculate what would be the drug systemic exposure and what would be the drug retention and skin. And here are the results, what, what we see that, what is the drug uh, disposition in patients with healthy and I mentioned with compromised skins. Uh, and we decided that the model for the compromised skins would be just the removal of stratum corneum, assuming that the integrity of stratum corneum uh, is damaged. And, and we can see uh, there are some differences and very interesting differences. So in healthy person, buprenorphine and oxycodone, uh, they have almost a similar profile. Uh, here are the different scales uh, showing the concentrations, but we can imagine that probably oxycodone has a even higher plasma concentration after transdermal administrations, but they are like in the same range. But what we also see that in a case of the skin lesions, we see that buprenorphine have almost the same behavior. So it just goes through the skin layers with a, almost the same, a little bit higher absorption rate. Whereas oxycodone, in a case of removal of stratum corneum, go through the impaired skin with really fast rate. It, it is much, much greater 
uh, and that the one shown by, by buprenorphine. And that finally results in dramatically high concentrations of, of this drug in plasma. And as I mentioned, when we talk about opioid receptors, so that means just applying oxycodone on a healthy skin, we have a low risk of side effects. But if there is some any problem with stratum corneum, the risk of side effects after using oxycodone dramatically increases. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a good result to know. And the next slide show the concentration of drug in different skin layers after, after using it in healthy patients as well as after using in patients with skin lesions. And right again, we see the differences between oxycodone and buprenorphine. We see that skin concentration of oxycodone, oxycodone would be pretty much the same for hours in a case of healthy skin. That means the stratum corneum for oxycodone shows the uh, works or serves as the real barrier. Oxycodone is barely permeable through the stratum corneum, but actually provides pretty decent concentrations in this uh, in, in this layers. And uh, I would like to remind you that these other layers where opioid receptors are located. And that means that oxygodon would be good enough to use uh, in normal skin and to engage with this receptor. But in, in a case of some damage of stratum corneum, oxygodon actually almost not found in, uh, in skin layers. It is almost completely uh, reaches the systemic circulations and remain there. And Gondos buprenorphine works slightly different. So buprenorphine doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, stop by by stratum corneum, and usually it goes through the skin layers regardless of the lesion with stratum corneum. The concentrations in viable epidermis and dermis is almost the same in normal skin or in skin which stratum corneum removed. So uh, th that can show that buprenorphine would be much more effective and much more and much safer for patients with uh, with skin lesions that may be associated with the problem with stratum corneum. Here are the results uh, of our study and I just summarized in my last slide. So we can use our platform to demonstrate the potential benefits and also and drawbacks of topical opioid agonists. Uh, for management of some typically presenting severe pain syndromes. And this platform helped complete missing PK parameters that are required for accurate PK profile modeling for different route of administrations, including transdermal or topical applications. And completed PK parameters can be used for predicting transdermal absorption rate and skin rotation of drugs with different physical chemical properties based on these properties and, uh, and PK parameters. And AIML platform may serve as a decision-making assistant for the therapy selection for patients, for example, with skin lesions or any, on any pain syndrome associated with any skin disorders. And this approach helped to understand drug concentration in skin lesions, which is essential for the relevant dosing but unfortunately, such measurements are impossible to perform in clinical settings because we understand that if we have a patient with skin lesions, we can judge, for example, thermal burns. That would be just a lot of bioethical reason not to perform any clinical studies. But here, I using the computational poor approach, we can we can predict pretty easily and with a with a high uh, uh, significance what going to happen if you apply drugs topically uh, in a case of, of skin disorders. And yeah, that's it. And thank you for attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. As before, just uh, either raise your hand or put them in the Q&A. Oh, uh, go ahead, Sasha. Uh, thank you, Maxim, for interesting presentation. Um, very interesting approach. Couple of questions. First of all, let's start from estimation of your uh, PK parameters. So, are you using the molecular structure of your drug to make an estimate, and and how many? If if so, like, do you have like extensive database of those different molecules and um, parameters, and then you can make the learning and make the prediction based on that database? How does it things organize? Yeah, good question. So the first thing, yes, we have a database. We have a proprietary database and uh, this database consists 
uh, I would say maybe 20,000 different compounds, but the most useful one, of course, all FDA approved drugs or drugs approved by uh, other national committees. And we try to use any publicly available data because you know, some data are proprietary and company then when they do some registering, they do not show them. So for, I would say for about a thousand drugs, we have a complete list of all parameters starting from physical chemical parameters that are easily available. For example, we can use PubChem database so we can find lipophilicity, we can find PKA, we can find other parameters that are necessary. Uh, we, can, we can find also pharmacokinetic parameters like protein binding, clearances, different type of clearances. So everything is, uh, is our, in our database. And we use it for training, like you mentioned. So training and testing. And this database, we always get the new data into it and we repeat our training. But as I mentioned, some of those drugs are missing some parameters. So then we can use this train system to predict those missing parameters for the drugs that don't have them. And uh, yes, we tried different different modes of operation and uh, the final result that we could reach that we can use only structural data. So the structural data would be enough to have some chemical properties, for example, TPCA. Uh, then we can predict block P, with, we can predict PKA and then use it for prediction of other pharmacokinetic parameters. So actually, this is probably the, uh, the, the final goal to reach that we have just a smile structure we run the, the engine and we have the PK profile. We are on the way, we have, uh, I, I guess, a, a, a lot of drugs that we can do it. We also are trying to refine our system to improve the accuracy, but we are on the way. And now we have some pretty decent prediction for just from structural structural properties. So um, if you don't mind, a couple more questions. When, when you use the SMILE diagram, obviously you convert it to digital world, probably using RD kit. Have you done any analysis of the properties which comes out of the small diagram, which is the most important um, influence the decision of the particular PK parameters? Is there something you can say like the majority of the cases that what drives the mechanism and contributes to what, mostly towards the prediction value, right? Yeah, th that's right. Uh, but you know, even when we say we, we use several types of smiles, it, it popcam smiles, popcam isomeric smiles, popcam canonical smiles, RDQ smiles. Uh, but usually using uh, CupChem uh, utilities, we derive a chemical descriptor from them and their number is really huge. So we, we can say just working with the structure, we have some thousand of, of chemical descriptors that can be used for the model training. That's why we use AI because that's actually any, any model is, is impossible to digest all this type of data. And my last question, so when you build your uh, model uh, of the skin and the different layers, obviously mm -hmm. uh, you make certain discretization. Um, I'm just wondering, like uh, given the structure you showed, obviously you're applying on the diffusion process, fixed law. Um, what is your main assumption when you come to the simulating the barrier? Do you take into account, you, you obviously take maybe just simple 1D case, but you know, you could also, you know, have a vertical permeability and transmissibility of the drug just parallel to the barrier. And what is the impact of that on overall prediction if you take it, you know, from 1D, let's say 2D model? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So, you know, it, from our experience, uh, we think that the simpler is the model is the better. Because if we use, for example, this three layer model, we have like three times more var variables parameters than for the single barrier model. So for example, when we use single layer model, like that one, uh, we want to know what would be systemic exposure. So that doesn't matter for AI algorithm, what is actually happening inside the skin. We need to know what is the drug concentration on the, like, on the, on the surface of skin and what with the systemic exposure. And that's enough when we just need to know what are the main parameters for drug, transdermal absorption. And usually when uh, drugs are administered transdermally, we are all, all, always thinking about systemic exposure. But when we know where the drug can, can remain, when it can stuck, then we understand that the composition of different chemical layers is different. So that's why we can use these three types of layer just to understand where a drug can stack, where it could be high accumulation of drugs, where it could be lower accumulation of, of drugs. That's why we use the systemic model. But right again, it you the three-layer model. I'm sorry, but right again, we are using just 
just typical equations for it and the parameters and values for, for these uh, equations are taken from, from the AI algorithms. Here's how it works. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, do you want to ask a question still quick? I know you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Maxim, for a very nice presentation, very interesting subject. Actually, Sasha already asked all my questions, and you already almost all answered. So, yeah, uh, my only uh, maybe a small question. Uh, so you consider the range of drugs, or is this a small molecule uh, predominantly, or have you considered antibodies, something like that, larger molecules? Well, talking about this project for transdermal, of course, antibodies can go through skin. So this is only about small molecules. And moreover, I mentioned that uh, I counted, I guess, 20 drugs approved by FDA can go through skin. All others require uh, permeability enhancers. For antibodies, we used to, to perform such kind of projects, but this is slightly different PPPK model. So actually, because there is no partitioning in the tissue, so the only thing that we are considered about is blood flow and lymph flow and their concentrations, and then how it goes through all the compartments. So yes, we, we, so antibodies, is, is there another field for PBPK modeling and using AI? But uh, specifically to this project, no, these are only small molecules. Okay. And uh, essentially for this class of drugs, your, so your, your PBPK model remains fixed. The structure yes. is fixed. Basically you are sort of optimizing the parameters running your, ML AI engine and uh, using some relationship from the yeah yeah it's absolutely correct the, the databases okay mm -hmm. thank you all right thank cool. you very much Maxim that was great um, got some good questions in there our uh, next and final speaker will be Alexander Lukanov Sasha as we call him and he is the global scientific director of AI ML. Uh, uncertainty analysis and quantifications at BIS Global. Sasha has over 15 years of hands-on experience in solving multidisciplinary problems involve, involving interesting synergy of physics, mathematics, numerical analysis, optimization, AIML, quantitative systems pharmacology, genomics analysis, and system biology. He focuses on digitalizing the lab experiments, utilizing synergy between laboratory machines and software systems, leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning methods for advanced design. His presentation is about AIML for reverse engineering, application of polymorphicology, and deconvolution of signaling pathways. Take it away, Sasha. Thank you, John. Let me make sure you have, yep, you're good. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, so um, thank you, John, for introduction. And I would like to thank all the presenters. Um, so and what I was thinking what to present as a last talk, obviously I didn't know what would be presented before. But I think, you know, it's a good opportunity to actually summarize and talk a little bit about AML, uh, data center and the QSP and then combination as I more or less said, like to build that bridge. So um, in light of this, you know, my talk will be constructed in two parts. First of all, I'll give you a couple of examples of successful usage of uh, AML in different application. We'll talk a little bit about um, kind of in general where I believe, you know, we could be, get the benefits of the applying machine learning QI uh, for QSP in general and in, spe in specific application. Uh, we will talk about the forward model, controllability, observability, and reconstructability of the system. Obviously, I will mention a few things because our webinar is actually called um, data center QSP and machine learning, when, what, and how. So obviously it would be important to highlight where I believe you know, things can be done using the machine learning, uh, how and, and what actually we can achieve by applying different machine learning techniques. Obviously already a couple of presentation mentioned, you know, the application of the machine learning, but I'll try to kind of make a little bit of the summary. And I think it, all those pre previous presentation can, can, kind of nicely fits to the framework, which I'm gonna show. Obviously, I would like to mention a few things about the uncertainty analysis and quantification, because that's an essential part of uh, any predictive modeling, and especially when it comes to the machine learning, because at the end of the day, it's a statistical method. 
um, and um, con different con to conventional deterministic modeling approach when you provide the number and there may be associated error bar. So here we always will be operating in terms of uh, prediction, uh, confidence interval, and the probability of, the, of, of confidence, you know, how confident we are in terms of predicting certain values. And that's essential part when you actually formulated the answer and you provide this certain analysis based into account that the method itself was uh, um, by the nature probabilistic one rather just completely deterministic. And uh, last but not least, of course, I'll show you a couple of application. I was trying to find some application which is different from the conventional PKPD type simulation. And um, actually that will be related to the scratch assay um, of the skin. Um, and um, that will kind of will be in light of what uh, Maxim was presented previously. And I'll show you how the machine learning can be used to actually identify some of the uh, system biology question uh, on you know, trying to understand the basic mechanism and that would help you know, to actually build a final um, model to predict and simulate the impact of the healing of the scratch on the skin, for example, using the different drugs. So first of all, I'll start with a couple of projects. Um, obviously, I would like to mention one of the projects that related to uh, pharmacogenomics. So um, you can do a lot of things when you have really big data here. We are talking about analysis of the genome, you know, uh, different readings, you know, different expression of the genes. It could be some other part of the regulatory network. And it's really big data um, by definition. I'm really actually mentioned in his slides. And analyzing this data, identifying the different aspect uh, when it related to different disease is essential uh, part in the, using the machine learning as well as a combination of machine learning and conventional bioinformatics tools, you can achieve uh, pretty significant results. So in that particular project, for example, um, uh, things was analyzed based on NSP macroarray data for the set of patients with different doses of drug administrator. And we were able to build a statistic, uh, statistically significant conclusion based on the AML analysis and uh, basically correlate SNP and dose of the, um, of the drug to different PG values uh, and make testing of the certain hypothesis. One of the examples which I'm going to mention later on in great detail, which is related to uh, quantity system um, pharmacology, will be related to actually analyzing the certain phenotype. Uh, in that case, would be just the rate of the healing of the wound on the skin. And then, you know, trying to show like how the machine learning can help to um, use the drug as a perturbation mechanism to reveal some of the signaling pathway, which is essential part also when you build the PKPD model, if when you have a clear picture overall. But else it would be also uh, important to demonstrate what, what is the impact of the uncertainty on certain process and um, how can you quantify that and take into account in the model later on. And last but not least, of course, um, when you do uh, analysis of the different um, um, drugs, you know, that could be based on the small molecule, as we already discussed, it could be on antibodies, but it could be also on some other important protein, which is a part of the, for example, inflammatory uh, signaling pathways. And for example, CFI deficiency is one of the important um, aspects which needs to be addressed. And machine learning is actually used to solve, uh, identify the particular residue for the mutation, improve the activity, actually to predict the activity curve overall, which will be part of the final PKPD type of simulation when you know the activity of the drug um, uh, and you can build you know, more accurate description. Especially we are talking about the potentially um, modified candidate, you know, you, which in silico you predict certain mutations, certain locations, and then you can run the oral analysis to demonstrate what will be the impact of that particular variant with the corresponding activity curve on oral performance of the treatment process. So, okay, let me now start with the analysis and a little bit of summarizing what we've done in the free previous presentation. And for the simplicity, I will focus on the structural analysis and linear analysis. Obviously, things can be easily generalized to the nonlinear situation, but I think at that point, it's just important to understand where things can be uh, implemented and what are the benefits of the machine learning. So you, you probably already saw realized it in a couple of previous presentations so that we are looking at some sort of solving dynamic system, uh, PKPD type of simulation. And um, they can be described by the simple ODE system. Let's assume that's for simplicity is a linear one. So, so far what we've seen were anyway linear ODE systems. We, it could be 
many compartments could be single compartments as uh, Michael or Maxim described in his pre and in, in their presentations. Um, and of course, you know, the state vector X it is just basically the one we are looking at. It could be concentration, it could be something else, you know, depending what, what you're trying to build. And that particular equation obviously uh, could be additional parameters which is related to control parameters. And, and there are some obviously studies where it just, you know, trying to understand, you know, what uh, should be the process to, let's say, inject uh, certain drugs at the particular time or maybe set of times or maybe continuous injection based on the concentration of, of the particular things in the system. And that allows you to introduce the state vector U, which is, you know, uh, basically your control vector. Of course, you know, we have initial condition of the administrative time of our drug. And what we can say at the moment, so obviously our operator A is the main operator, which uh, could be mechanistically based operator, it could be a physiologically based constructed operator, it could be even machine learning based constructed operator. So, and I will uh, roughly describe, you know, the connectivity between general formulation, what, for example, Morley talked in his presentation, but the bottom line, that operator itself can be split it in the three components. One is a conventional PK, PK operator, and we've seen that in Michael's presentation could be also contribution from the uh, PD, and then it could be a contribution from the PG, depending how complex your system and which effects you want to incorporate. Again, this is for simplicity. We're considering the linear system, things could be generalized in a nonlinear case, but let's just keep it simple. And last but not least, of course, we all trying to measure what is happening with our system when we design and monitor the um, performance of the efficiency of our drug or treatment process. And for that reason, we have a measurement why, and we have a connectivity. Um, sometimes it could be a very complex connectivity with our state vector and our control vectors. And of course, if your measurement a lot, why, and it has a big dimension and, and let's say matrix C, is a square matrix, you can directly invert that matrix and find what's the state of your system based on your measurement. In that case, you even don't need to solve ODE or solve any complex you know, forward model. You just simply invert the data and obtain the state. And that's kind of what Murley uh, was showing in his approach when uh, uh, there are some observations and you can make the conclusion about certain aspects by just basically operating with some measurements and some of the data without even considering, you know, um, dynamic process or dynamic OD in, in his presentation. So that's perfectly fine. And depending on the case, obviously, uh, sometimes it's possible, but sometimes it's not possible. In most of the situation, our measurement uh, is actually in most of the conventional PKPD type of problems is very um, limited. It, it, it's basically sometimes merge average concentration around the tissue let's say concentration liver and some other aspects, and you don't have even distribution, or even don't have enough time points when you produce the measurement. And that's what makes the uh, complexity of, of all the process. Furthermore, we could have uh, all sorts of measurements. So let's imagine that, you know, we administrated the drug to one of our study species, let's say mouse, that's a very common uh, study lab species. And, and we do measure not only, let's say, some of the data let's come you know from blood or plasma uh, or like some other specific area but we also do the imaging of you know contrast imaging of, of propagation of some things and we could measure that in time and we by doing these things we are accumulating the large set of data which ideally you would like somehow incorporate into your analysis and make sure that your model or whatever you're building is for the model does not contradict all other sorts of information you have and then the question like, how can we do these things? Can we actually incorporate all this data and make sure that they consistent? And that raises two things about what we call controllability of your system and observability of your system, which is very tightly connected to each other. So let me talk, tell about a little bit for controllability, especially for the people who doesn't have like a background in the control theory, what does it mean? Effectively, uh, what it means is by definition, so if you have um, a state x0 at certain moment, let's say time equal to zero at your initial time, and uh, the, we say that the system is controllable if for the given finite uh, period of time, you could have a uh, design such such a uh, um, control parameters u, and that basically will lead to x0 equal to zero. So effectively, you can always maintain your position at zero. Uh, it could be a generalized obviously more, um, general cases, but the bottom line is that what it means that if you have a desirable behavior of your system, the controllability means that you can always keep 
around the desirable behavior. So if the system deviates from the desirable behavior, you can always find the control parameters to push it back on the trajectory you would like to, to have as your solution of the system. And sometimes it's not always possible for some of the system, but sometimes it's possible. And what we want from the um, um, basically designing the treatment plan so that, you know, we want to have a very desirable effect after all. We want to have a controllability. We want to make sure that whatever we inject or deliver or administrate to the patient achieves certain level of confidence and desirable um, trajectory path, especially for the treatment of certain disease. So, and mathematically, obviously, uh, we know that the controllability related to the parameter B, matrix B, as I was shown in the previous slide, and A is designed using various approach. So, if, if we wanted to check where we can control that system, we just basically need to check that the following determinant of those matrices multiplication is not zero. It's kind of very complex from a mathematical point of view, especially when B, we don't know. And assume that the B is actually obtained by a, a machine learning network because our uh, control parameters could be very complex. In that sense, you know, obviously it's very difficult um, to check everything, but you know, with current state of the advanced control theory and mathematics, uh, thanks for that, you know, it's able to compute those things very quickly and then make analysis where your system is controllable. And that can be used as one of the filtering factor where you build your compartments model correctly and where it is that model is observable during your set of measurement or control parameters. So when it comes to the observability, we can also uh, formulate similar condition, which, which you know, basically uh, specify that the given set of uh, output measurements, you would like to make sure that you can um, obtain uh, the information about the trajectory path. And as I mentioned, you know, if you measure exactly the same number of um, points as your uh, state vector and your C matrix and that equation is uh, rectangle, you can basically invert that matrix as it's invertible and you can already give the answer, right? Just based on the measurement. But in reality, obviously we don't have the luxury to, to, to have such a measurement because measurement is always more complex than the overall dynamic system description forward model. So therefore uh, we have a situation when we can check the trunk, but again, you know, our link or operator uh, could be described by a very complex neural network, which connects the measurement and the state vector. And again, you know, we can check these things and make the sure that whatever we put in our PKPT forward model is consistent with the observability criteria. So there are some other less important, but still important aspects, which I'm just gonna briefly mention, it, which is related to constructability, reconstructability and ductibility. All those aspects are very important. They will affect, you know, the selection of your operator A in your equation and giving the measurement you provided. Um, and that's important step to perform, which kind of allows you to say that, you know, subject to the measurements you have in the data about your system, um, about your biological system or the process you are studying, you can guarantee that you're observable, controllable, and there are some other nice features you can guarantee. And that's obviously can be used when you're trying to filter out which compartment models you need to put in place and study giving your measurement. It, obviously, life is not that simple. I mean, obviously, there are many complex biological processes in the system. It could be, um, and obviously, sometimes we can make, we can build a system which is a controllable for part of the variable states, and for some other part, it could be uncontrollable. And it, that's very commonly appears, especially that we don't have a full knowledge about the whole the regulatory network within the system. That maybe will be addressed at some point, but at this moment, we know some part of kind of environmental space where we know like certain uh, signaling pathways uh, complete and fully described, but overall we don't have the, the entire information. Um, so therefore, like, you know, we can definitely split in terms of the controllable, non-controllable, and uh, most of the time we need to operate with that situation. Uh, it's still important to understand what is controllable because at least, you know, that will be uh, as an important step towards the analysis of the final results. In addition, it could be cascade of model. And in that case, obviously, uh, in the cascade of model, some of the models can be observable and controllable, but in our case, it could be completely uh, non-observable and, and not controllable. And that else is a possibility and that has to be taken into account. So where's the machine learning can come into the game? Obviously, uh, we already discussed a few, uh, multi, uh, several application and point application. First of all, operator A itself, can be constructed, and especially we, had, we were talked about the missing key parameters, which can be derived from the machine learning as per maximum operation. 
when we do the measurements and we can use the measurements to already figure out about the state vector, so which more or less was described in more representation. And of course, when Mikhail was talking about his model, he was taking, talking about like what general description um, or type of approach to the PKD sim simulation and what are the necessary steps and data need to be put in place in order to select one model versus another model, different criteria. Uh, and one of the additional effect where we can apply the machine learning is actually integrating those equations. So, you know, obviously there are already existing tools um, and methods, you know, some commercial license, you know, open source, uh, academic uh, code, et cetera, maybe in-house developed code, but there are also opportunity to actually use the neural network to integrate the system, especially when it comes to very large set of ODEs altogether. We are talking about, you know, millions of ODE, for example. And in that case, you know, my machine learning will help, you know, to quickly integrate this one um, using, you know, pre-trained algorithm. Um, I would interesting to discuss a little bit more in details the aspect where we pretend uh, concentrating at BISC. Uh, so we assume that, you know, the forward model, PKPD model is given to us. And what we are trying to incorporate is more detailed analysis all the data around um, that particular study. So imagine that we have a set of the images, it could be G signal, and we're trying to incorporate this information into the PKT, PKPD, PKPD modeling. So how do we perform that analysis? So you, we usually, we extract the certain features from those uh, input data, and then we train the model and we're trying to predict the state vector. So imagine that your state vector is a concentration in certain compartments. Let's say it's a two compartment model, you know, you measure concentration average in the liver or, you know, in, in the blood. Uh, and, and then basically we're trying to map all our information to this one. That's what I called um, the forward uh, machine learning model, which, you know, trying to shrink all big data, which related to images and some other uh, time series, or it could be like a signal into something which, you know, directly um, participate in the PKTP model. The bottom line, we want uh, to, to check where the system is a controllable and observable. For that reason, we actually need to now invert that net neural network we built and then check the criteria I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and obviously it's a tricky exercise. Uh, it was a lot of um, high contents in what you're doing, but the bottom line, what I want to make sure that you understand that it's possible to do, there are certain algorithms. You can construct the inversion, this one with some approximation, obviously it's not directly inverse matrix per se, if you're talking about linear algebra, because those, those are um, system are more complex and not invertible in the classical sense, but in, in, um, in the sense that you know you can verify the contributive observability, it's still possible to do. And it allows us to check where whatever the given to us PKPD model is actually consistent. It's consistent with those measurements which are provided by some other source or information available or associated with the study. And if it is the case, you know, we can use the forward model and uh, we can uh, you know perform the conventional analysis, uh, build the solution, uh, you know, check the half-life, check you know the dosage, you know, minimal dosage. And, and that would be, you know, some sort of the entire framework, which allows us to firstly, A, check that it's consistent uh, in terms of observability and controllability of the existing data, and then B, perform the analysis. So now in terms of the uncertainty optimization, it's, uh, it's important to realize that when you do the measurement of some of the variables, state variables, you measure them with error. And that error will define where some of the compartments need to be present or not. Because if you uh, know that your error of the measurement, I don't know, 20%, then you can argue that some of the compartment does not contribute enough to capture that sensitivity uh, or basically will be some sort of diminished by the other contributing in, in your PKPD model. And therefore there is no, even no point to refine your model adding by new compartments. So therefore effect of the influence of the, each of the PK parameters on the error itself and the comparison, the measurement error with the error which comes for the uncertainty in your parameters is an important spec to decide which term in your equation needs to be a state because it will be you know, meaningful and measurable versus some of the um, term which you know, may be important, but because you are not able to measure accurately enough, 
those are terms will not play significant role. So if you want to keep them significant, maybe you need to measure with the accuracy of 1% instead of the 20%. And that's important to realize. So for that reason, we perform usually global sensitivity analysis using the Sobel decomposition and some other aspects that we, we've done that analysis to demonstrate which terms in the commercial PKPD model needs to be kept and uh, used for the analysis. So usually the, the main elements here is obviously the Sobel of decomposition, of the variance, uh, you computed that uh, using the global sensitivity analysis, you build the hyper cube gra graph for all your parameterization, you compute certain um, standard deviation, giving you know, certain information. And basically based on the um, um, total sensitivity and then uh, split of the total sensitivity in terms of S1, S2, S3, you can make a decision which one of them parameters should be kept and what would be the uh, impact of basically a uh, relationship between your sensitivity of measuring the data and your basically uh, solution and the variance of the solution given the uncertainty in your parameters. Uh, I'm gonna probably skip one and uh, for the sake of time, dive in straight away to the one of the examples. It's related to analysis of the signaling pathways. Uh, and for that reason, we will use the perturbation mechanism. So the drug is actually used to perturbate the system, measure the response to different drugs. And then once we know how the drug is connected to, let's say, human kinoma or kinesis, we can eliminate drug uh, via machine learning and we can connect phenotype with the kinesis. And by this, by doing these things, we can see which are the processes the most uh, important in particular for that particular phenotype. And we can target it for example, in that case, we are talking about the scratch assay of the skin. We, we can target those uh, kinases with specific drugs or combination of drugs. And I'm gonna mention how we also use the uh, machine learning to build up the cocktail of drugs, which has a specific target, uh, certain kinases and a limiting number of targets. So let me dive in. So into the details. So we, we have a drug, we have a target. Uh, we obviously have a data in, um, it's it's uh, the data which shows the uh, how do your um, activity of the kinases is changed as a, a certain concentration of drug. So you can obviously formalize this in terms of the activity matrix, um, and then this kind of the information can be used to now to answer two things. First of all, you would like to understand which are the kinases are most important, for example, for healing the wound, and also it is important to um, to answer the question where it is possible to build a combination of two drugs in certain concentration, which will be more effective when one drug on its own. And that will be obviously related to polypharmacology domain where people combine different drugs with different concentration to address more effectively one of the particular uh, signaling pathways and uh, treat the disease. So obviously for that reason, um, we need to make sure that uh, activity curve is fit nicely because we extract the uh, um, certain activity out of this curve and then goes into the um, uh, activity matrix, which we use later on in machine learning. And here's already, we could cha chase, uh, chase some sort of the biological problem of the measurement that activity, especially when it comes to the uh, in vitro versus in vivo. And what are the else competitive mechanism uh, present in, uh, in vivo, for example, measurement? And how do you characterize this one? And for this reason, machine learning is also can be used because you can actually switch between different mechanisms and you can train your model to identify when do you need to use one mechanism versus another, especially when you're developing the time or your particular, um, if you're in a particular set of the process. And there are obviously well-known certain mechanism and you can take the correction from that mechanism when you make the uh, assessment of your final activity matrix, especially when it comes to the uh, live you know, cell line in vivo um, prediction, et cetera, compared to in vitro one. So for that reason, once you get that matrix, uh, a correction matrix, you have uh, the tree of a human kinome. So you can formulate the equation uh, and you can perform combinatorial combination with machine learning to predict uh, different activities of the cocktail of drugs. So that shows you basically the activity of the drug across the um, um, different concentration and ki kinases. So you, you basically combine two drugs with different concentration and you see how do they, that uh, mixture of the drugs impact the different kinases in, in, in the kinome tree. And then by doing these things, you can obviously identify some of the situation um, so that you, know, you can improve the, the 
effectivity of the treatment, you know, versus if you just administrate it to one particular drug at certain concentration. And obviously, um, um, you could compare your uh, machine learning prediction of the activity versus um, experimental blind experimental tests. So that, for example, you see the theory is uh, dot and experiment was a blind to perform for the uh, two drugs, uh, which we mixed up and then it was profiled against the kinesis. And, um, and they see like, you know, qualitatively you can using machine learning pretty good uh, reconstruct the activity. Obviously it's not spot on, but you know, there is a lot of assumptions here, um, but overall qual qualitatively it looks very good. So where's the machine learning comes? So once you administrated certain drugs and you're measuring the healing process, you have usually a connectivity between phenotype and the concentration of the, and then drug and the concentration. What you're trying to achieve, you want to achieve some sort of functional relation between phenotype and the kinesis, and you want to have the weighting factor net to the kinesis to, to see which one is the most important one. So obviously uh, you can do the loss regression analysis. You can eliminate the drug as a perturbation mechanism. You can, uh, you, you, of course, you need to use the activity matrix to give it here. And then you can obtain those coefficient beta and um, beta zero and beta, which is basically your weight, which show which of the kinases contribute. Of course, you know, here there's a lot of uncertainty because even if you know what is your competitive mechanism, you still don't know what, for example, the ATP concentration in the cell. And that's a kind of, you know, there are different strategies for a different cell line. And you can basically uh, uh, perturbate that concentration to see what would be the list of the kinases which comes out out of the machine learnings. And uh, I wanted to show, first of all, of course, you know, uh, how good is your prediction, so which is, you know, not bad. And secondly, if you perturbate, for example, ITP concentration, you could have a slightly different kinesis list, which impact uh, your uh, phenotype of interest. And in, in that case, for example, the, the healing rate of the wounds. And look into those kinesis, you can see that, you know, for some of the situation, you can statistically build the kinesis, which is most likely, highly likely will contribute significantly towards that process. And then you can start building up your drug or cocktail of drugs, which will target the particular kinesis. So that's kind of uh, ends my presentation. So, and um, if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them. And thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Sasha. All right, if you want to raise your hand like before or um, put your questions in the Q&A or chat. Okay, uh, Maxim. Yes, such a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a quick question about polypharmacology that you did with ML. So you show the slide about the different targets that can be affected by one drugs or some of drugs. So that probably support that like drugs can compete on the same targets taken to the affinity to come to the affinity. Did you consider the pharmacokinetic uh, interactions? For example, acceleration of metabolism, inhibition of metabolism, because that's, that also would uh, affect engagement. Uh, no, we, we didn't consider that we've done the very simplistic uh, mixing rules. Uh, all those aspects are obviously important. Uh, that's why when you compare, let's say, that curve, which shows you know, our prediction versus the experiment. So yes, you, you see that you kind of like, uh, not too too far qualitatively, but it's it's still you know room for the improvements, right? But at least it 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 tells you like you know instead of maybe wasting time and trying to develop the most sophisticated model, uh, you can probably go in that point and then actually test that combination of two drugs in a laboratory, right, and see where it, it works or not. Because at this point, you know that's much faster versus like developing the model itself. Unless if you see the application of this model later on for whatever reason, and you need it, right? Then you would spend time to do it. At this point, it's more like a screening, five screening tool to see where you're like in the right direction or wrong. All right, so this is not about drug-drug interaction prediction, but mostly about the efficacy of drug combination. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, thank you, Sasha, for a nice presentation. Uh, uh, so my knowledge uh, in, uh, in the machine learning is very minimal, actually close to zero. <laughs> uh, but I think I, I, I understand the concept in general. I just want to make sure. So, so suppose we have a kinetic 
system, right? Describe it by the equations, uh, PK, PD equations, whatever, right? And uh, they have certain parameters. Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, it's a good example. Yeah, and uh, it, this system has parameters, right? And then if we have uh, other sources like imaging data, some other covariates, biomarkers that other speakers talk to. Uh, so uh, using machine learning technique, we can actually combine the whole this whole flow of inf uh, information in this sort of optimize, right? So yeah, so basically it's important to um, understand what do you mean by combine. So combine means that uh, this is a operator is, for example, what you give it to me. Yeah, right? constants, for example. Yeah. So you, you said that Eight this constants. is your model. Yeah. And you also <laughs> give it to me YT, right? Which is your, mm -hmm. your images, signal, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your system X is a concentration, right? Yes. So what, yeah. what I'm building, the machine learning, which is mapping from the, this data towards your concentration. This is a forward mm -hmm. data. Where's yeah. the combination comes? The combination comes by checking those two conditions, right? Especially this one. So you don't have any control parameters in your system because you don't actually do continuous injection or whatever. You just want to make sure that Whatever the data you build, whatever the mapping you constructed from the machine learning point of view, it allows you to say uh, whether your system is observable mm -hmm. or not. And if it's true, then you can argue that you, whatever the model you give it to me, your PKPD model is a consistent, you can carry on doing the simulation and it will be in consistency with any observation data. But most likely you don't have that condition realized. And then you start playing what you can drop on, what you can adjust in your operator A to make sure that you know it does fits the rest of the data you observed. So, and that will be basically now a consistency check or sanity check <laughs> where all the data you have for your study does satisfy the model you built. Otherwise you could be completely operating in two different ways. <laughs> trying to build the machine learning from Y to X without doing the PKPD. And you can do the PKD without actually looking where your Y to X does exist in much, right? So you're trying to, put them together and check mm -hmm. whether this condition is actually true or not. Yeah. I'm wondering uh, how large uh, this data set uh, have uh, to of be. Course, of course, it's, it depends. The C operator depends mm -hmm. on the machine learning model, the model you picked up. For example, imagine that I take the uh, random forest model, which uh, Morley mentioned in his presentation, and it has certain, you know, parameters measured like, you know, ratio, some uh, classification where the patient has a, um, 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 some of the disease, right? You know, uh, um, and, and then basically, you know, imagine that I construct that random force model, which maps basically my state vector into a certain classification where it has disease, no disease, etc. So the question, uh, that, that data, that is a huge data, right? I mean, because, you know, we have a multiple uh, big data sampling from the population. Uh, it's a huge database so, and that operator built in place. Now, imagine that you decided to make some PKPD for that type of the disease simulation and, and check the aspect, how the drug would propagate and what would be the concentration, giving that information. So effectively you can combine them together, but you may need to make sure that they do exist, they can exist together simultaneously. Why that uh, compatibility condition, let's put it mm -hmm. this way, right? So that, that allows you to say like, I'm not contradicting anything by bringing those yeah. two sets together, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's not trivial exercise giving all those aspects you need to build up, right? You know, you need to first of all build the machine learning map data. And you see like from early presentation, there is a lot of aspects involved. And as well as from your side, you know, on selecting operator A, there is a lot of uh, try and error approach as you mentioned. Um, and then the question is like, once you're happy, once someone who's processing the data and measurement is happy, do you actually can live together? Yeah, agree, yeah. So maybe related question to the size of the data. So, uh, so suppose your system is very noisy uh, and by definition is very noisy. And that's probably the question to controllability, right? Uh, so how can you make sure that, uh, that the response that you see, it deviates because of some systematic, uh, systematic uh, bias or, or reasons or it just, uh, um, just uncertainty or error of measurements or, or uh, any other variability, biological or? Well, that, that can be definitely studied by, uh, okay, let me go to this uh, first slide. 
So obviously, assuming that I wanted to put some noise, model the noise in that additional mm -hmm. term by control parameters, which affect, which obviously depends on X, right? So that effectively will be a stochastic ODE you wanted to solve. So the question, this operator, if you can represent that, you can check where it is controllability, meaning that by the noise, can you stay still, you know, put in the right trajectory or it's completely will blow up and will deviate it uh, regardless what is your noise, it will be moving away, right? So uh, that can be done by this mm -hmm. analysis or it could be separately uh, separating the noise from, uh, so you can split the operator A from the median one and then plus noise and you can directly study, you know, your uh, mean operator and your contribution for the noise could be just added later on as, a, as an additional things, right? You know, multiple ways here. I, I don't think so. I have like um, um, the solution in terms of uniform solution. Like obviously there is no free lunch here in terms of there is no unified approach you can pick up and then mm -hmm. use it for study. It depends on the application, depending on the, what is the noise and variability, where it comes from. Uh, uncertainty analysis quantification it also help you to, for example, to identify um, which of the compartment is sensitive towards the perturbation or not. And then maybe you could argue that you can just based on that criteria can drop and reduce the noisiness in, in your solution after that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions for Sasha? I don't see any in the Q&A. Um, all right. Great talks today. Um, let's uh, go to the uh, Q and A at the end. We we may have exhausted all the questions, so um, as if any come up, uh, we'll get to those. I'll, I have a question for the speakers and the panelists. I think what we heard today, again, with any machine learning approach, you know, something I did for years and back at my days at Merck, etc., is what I call model quality data, you know, have and having enough of it. So I think today we kind of saw that a lot of this modeling is dependent on data and model quality data. Um, we're, we're seeing companies that are um, starting to uh, collate and curate data for a living. And I think this is going to continue, but I just kind of uh, would like to hear everybody's thoughts on um, maybe what you think we should be doing differently from a data perspective and, and what I call model quality data. So whoever wants to start, just, just go ahead. Um, I can start. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously curating the data is, is an important step. However, it has its own caveats in terms of who is doing, what is the reason, and what is the purpose, right? You know, it's, and if it's transparent and clear, and then whatever the attribute or metadata uh, assigned to the data you curated that you can actually revert it back if you are not happy with some of the assumptions, uh, assumptions behind the, the process that can restore the original data, I'm perfectly fine. But I would rather um, maybe keep it, you know, as it is, whatever the data is available, um, and maybe it's more related to the fairness of the data we already discussed with you, John, in a couple of the webinars. Um, if it's transparent and clear and, you know, it addresses the, the methodology, how the data was obtained, I think the curation process um, is important, but it can be done separately by each of the scientists or application, whatever it is necessary. The, the tendency which I've seen sometimes the curation of the data lost their very important details, which is very difficult to track it back. And I think that somehow needs to be um, acknowledged. And, and of course, you know, you don't want to release only whatever you wanted to release for the sake of the um, demonstrating that, you know, only successful stories. You wanted to release all the data and all the results, to make sure that you can have a proper assessment of the entire the simulation pipeline of predictions, right? So that, those are, would be my thoughts on that question. Okay. And if I can jump in, uh, I sort of second what Sasha just said. I think the key issue is that uh, you really have to uh, be very aware of observer bias, right? And so I think that we all collect data for our own purposes with our own biases. And the whole point of investigating um, data 
uh, is twofold to find things that you didn't know before and you did not expect, which is uh, which is a, a which is a contradiction because you really also want that same data set. Uh, to sort of validate something that's already known. And these two things uh, are in direct conflict with each other. The surprise element and the, comes from finding something new that you can test again and, and make discoveries around and the validation element, which is from finding something that you already know that builds confidence on your new discovery. So the two elements have to be in the same place. And I don't know how uh, you actually address it uh, effectively. So, uh, Dr. Morale, I'm not picking on you, right? But my question is academia, could some of this be taught in school? And I'm not saying even college or graduate school, but even earlier, right? The whole scientific method, the, the need for the scientists to be um, more aware of data as an asset, you know, that ground roots type of approach. Because after my 30 years of doing this, I found that it's a cultural problem in R&D, right? That, that we don't have this mindset, like, you know, we, we have it with money and all, you know, this data is just converted currency, right? But we don't have it with our data. And I feel this is the, the root cause of the problem. I am sort of going through my own, uh, 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 pardon me, I'm an academic, so I tend to sometimes become philosophical, uh, my own experience of with, of with data. And if you look at the traditional tra trajectory at which, uh, from which many of us um, grow into data, it is typically starting out with, with arithmetic and mathematics and maybe progressing into statistics. But all of us actually grow the most when we experience problems and we experience data on our own. Because then all the statistics and the mathematics and everything that you invested in uh, suddenly begins to make sense because it's, it's personal, right? Yeah. And I don't know how we can go. And I think that 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 data intuition is another thing that many, many people, uh, uh, many of us who have experience have developed. We don't need to dive into every spreadsheet and every column of data to figure out uh, whether the integrity has been compromised in some way. That is because we know our domain so well, right? You know, maybe there's that easy 50 makes no sense or maybe whatever it is that we use as a heuristic. So those are the two things. I think there's the intuition and there's the experience that teaches you about the method. And I don't know how to approach it, but I think that it's going to become important and very fundamental. Maybe college is the place to start. Okay. Any, anybody want to comment on that? Uh, maybe, maybe I can end on that yeah. one. We don't want to be trapped ourselves in a situation when everything will be data driven, right? So I, I would I could imagine the situation when even multiplication of two matrices at some point, at some point will be just statistical. What if I'll multiply two matrices? Okay, that looks like this answer with probability of ninety five percent. We don't want to be in a situation because those are things are deterministic. We can we need to teach. We need to know that the people understand the things coming from. It's important because any data analysis. I mean, one, Morally mentioned one of the theory I'm important, the no free lunch, but there is now one garbage in, garbage out. You need to make sure that, you know, the domain knowledge is still there. You understand what they're doing with the data. And without that, you know, you could do all sorts of crazy things, right? So even if it is data driven. So therefore, like the data has to come in the right time when the person is already know and has a certain fundamental knowledge before actually start operating and relying on those tools because they could be very dangerous equally. Um, and used in a very different way. Yeah. Okay. Um, if Michael or Maxim, you have any comments, I'll, we'll kind of move on to another question. You know, I, I have a quick comment. I will join Sasha talking about the data curation accuracy of this data, because, you know, I, in my experience, sometimes people, the research team, they curate data for their own purpose and then just release it to the media and to the audience. And 
I had an experience when we just uploaded like a huge data into the database and then found out that it is not accurate. And so we, we needed to refine the whole database trying to figure out what is wrong. So I, I would love to, you know, to find some source of, of like a accurate data for, for other level for PK and PD parameters. But uh, on the other hand, it always needs some verification. And it also our own manual work. So I, I don't know, maybe we can automate it. Maybe just to find some outliers that would show you that this is probably the corrupt source or it's yeah. just the correct data. That, that, that'd be probably good. Maybe it, it would be another implementation for ML algorithms to just check all the data to find outliers, to, to find the data that doesn't correspond to some patterns so we can identify them. That's for, 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 for me, for example, because I'm responsible in our team for the uh, uh, scientific accuracy of the database to find out what data is correct and what data is not, I would say not so correct. It actually raises a very interesting point, Maxim, after your comment. So would it be possible at some point to have op all database are open so that the crowdsourcing activity can actually clean this up? Because, you know, obviously, the manpower and the crowdsource is much huge compared to any other activities. So they can figure out quite easily, someone find the spare time to check and say like, oh, this is wrong or something like that. But the question like where we can achieve that moment in time because the data in most of the companies is treasure. That's what caused the asset and they rely on some of the product based on the data. And it's really hard to actually combine. And that's the reason the federated machine learning come into the game when you know you cannot actually get access to the full data across different providers, but you're trying to train your model, but you don't know how the data was created in the first place, who was behind the scenes, you know, for that particular database. And that could potentially lead to, you know, a wrong conclusion, right? So that we're trying to avoid. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's like other areas, and I, Michael, you probably want to comment here too. You've got standards, you've got uh, what uh, uh, Morale brought up before around, you know, metadata, all these things kind of come into play. There is a high level of complexity, I think, in the, the environments that you guys are working in, compounded by the algorithmic approach training sets, et cetera, you know, versioning models, all that comes into play here. There is a level of complexity here. But I think based on my experience on, I walk into 80% data wrangling environments. Like I, I have people that are so uptight sometimes because of their data environments. They don't know if they can use data. They don't know, they, it's not fair. They, they don't know if they can access it. They don't even know about it. And then Many times you have competing or opposing camps in these areas in large pharma. Um, and it's like a big, really big tight knot. You have to figure out how to undo it and, and kind of le level it and start over. And um, th that's some of the experiences that I've had. So if I can jump in, uh, John, um, my personal feeling is that uh, creation of large data sets uh, is best done when it's planned and centralized. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, a lot of the times, the temptation is to agglomerate data, aggregate data. Oh, so uh, investigator X has, uh, you know, 200 MS patients and investigator Y has 300 MS patients. Let me put it all together. Uh, obviously, that gives you a jump start. It gives you a sense for the di diversity and the heterogeneity of, of a few measures, but it does not make for a good... Uh, um, process that doesn't require data rightly. Let me put it this way. Uh -huh. uh, on the other hand, I uh, have gone into, as you notice, I tend to focus a lot on, on government sources of data. And the quality of some of those resources is just remarkable. Uh, I can tell you that in the private sector or in academia, any effort to collect data is not fundable. Uh -huh. So if I was a clinician and I had, I'm just making this up, if I had my entire, if I had the entire United States as my patient population, I still would not be able to find folks who do the data collection, the data entry, uh, 
the quality control. There would be no way I could fund that. Uh, but on the other hand, the government has developed processes that are quite uh, getting better with time. Yep. Uh, uh, and that you can sort of see, I go into the NHINs all the time. I've gone into some, some really big uh, data sets. And you go, on the other hand, to some scientific papers and people put out a quote unquote uh, uh, data into public repositories, the quality gets, goes downhill really fast. Yeah. They get large, very heterogeneous, but you really don't know. The QC is just so poor in repositories. It's crowdsourced, I mean. And so I, that's my general sense. So I go into these, uh, I don't go, I avoid repositories if I can. Let me put it this way. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Michael? I know you've been off mute for a little while, so you're probably trying to get a word in. Yeah, so I, well, my problems are usually that I'm currently working on, uh, they are they're based on small data. Uh -huh. So my problem is actually getting the data itself. So is that uh, biology is not understood. Mechanisms are unknown. We're just guessing. So based on some preclinical experiments and some very, very limited clinical data. So that's the right. problem. There is a phrase out there. Big data gets all the press. Little data does all the work. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. yeah. It depends well, who you are and what yeah, you're doing, but yeah. 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 So typically for constructing our models, I mean, the model that I illustrated, so it's uh, it comes from like uh, 30 animals, 30 plus animals, 40 animals, and uh, it's just uh, maybe dozens of time points, essentially, right? So we are trying to build relationships through this data. And uh, there are other sources like imaging data, but uh, those are unreliable and qualitative rather than quantitative. So we don't know how to interpret this type of data. I mean, we know, but we, we take it with a grain of, uh, yeah. yeah, so. And uh, of course there are in, like in vitro uh, cell, cell type assay data. And uh, of course there are bioinformatics data on, uh, on relationship between genes, you know, associated with certain diseases. Uh, so, yeah. Do we see? Do you guys see more uh, technologies in the near future, like um, you know, organ on a chip, or or different approaches where you think you might be able to um, enhance your work, or do you think it's going to be a slow, a slower move forward, or is it a dumb question? I mean, in my experience, again, what I see is a sort of, uh, it's a by stages. So it's like uh, uh, first uh, bioinformatics groups identify uh, targets and uh, potential molecules, then uh, preclinical experiments uh, confirm or basically validate the hypothesis and then uh, uh, and, and then preclinical data being generated like PK and pharmacology data. And then we build some kind of PKPD yeah. models and test it in human. That's the process, right? So given the, all other limitations like safety and toxicology and, uh, and uh, agency regulations. Yeah. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but, and you all know this, but small molecules, Make, make some progress. Large molecules are, are hard in this space, right? And I think this is where, where we need new discoveries. We need new ways of, of approaching things. Any comments on that? Alex, you agree or disagree? No, I agree. That's, that's the reason we actually kicked off the discussion about the machine learning and data centric yeah. use, because I think that's one of the opportunity to I uh, think a little bit out of the box uh, and then trying to apply various sorts of information. And then obviously discoveries comes in, you know, more smart drugs will be developed because, you know, they will be like really specialized, take into account certain aspect rather just be pretty much every step across the population and then have a very coarse type of uh, treatment plan. So I think it's not only combination of the molecular structure, right? Small versus large, but else, you know, how do you administrate it? What do you do? Like, you know, dosage, et cetera. They all comes to the game and be like more uh, tailoring towards the 
your concrete personality in terms of like what what is your biological system looks like and what do you need rather just you know you and me taking the same in a sense right yeah. and see why it works where it doesn't work so i think that's where the advantage is uh, is going to be made in the future so again you know combination of various of drugs etc that's that's something you know actively exploiting um that also potentially could lead to uh, and actually if you look at the history of some of the very impressive drugs you know they usually discard you know very unaccidentally right so completely not you know working in that direction right yeah. like develop for something else and suddenly it started working elsewhere right more yeah. effective so all right. Uh, any questions from the panel? Do you guys want to ask the, a question that maybe I didn't ask or or you were thinking about that you would like to get everyone's opinion on? Maybe I can just say and thank everyone for accepting the invitation to come to the webinar. Yeah. Was, yeah. You know, really great pleasure to listen to the talks and um, and having a discussion with you and hear some of your opinions. Obviously, we'll keep pushing that initiative to organize maybe like on a yearly basis, some of the events like that. Uh, and hopefully it will become like a small local chapter and uh, we'll see the progress from all the participants, right? Yeah. Yeah, don't give up the fight. It's a, it's a noble effort that everybody's doing and uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, and it was great to see, I, I did some, um, a colleague in mine published a paper years ago at GSK on Bayesian learning and replacing animals uh, models with Bayesian learning. And um, uh, it's, it's great to see how powerful the Bayesian models still are. And uh, I think what people that aren't in this space don't realize sometimes is you almost run out of options of what do we do next? We, we don't, we're not sure where to go. And sometimes the models help you go into a new direction or you say, well, I, I went in that direction. Now I'm going in the other. And um, so it's, uh, it was really interesting to see the talks today. And I thought everyone did an awesome job. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for uh, a great presentations. And I learned a lot personally. And uh, by the way, uh, I see that uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, webinar was recorded, right? So oh yeah, it's going to go on demand. So okay, okay, people so will register for it and watch it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so then we can always go back and take uh, references and. Uh, yep. Uh, it was very very useful. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. Okay, well, thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank Enjoy uh, the, the rest of your week, Friday, and have a great weekend. And thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you so Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, all. Right. thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Max. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mariah. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>